Hey guys, my name's Echo Kellum. I play Curtis Hall, aka Mr. Terrific, on CW Arrow, and you're listening to Neil the Four Pot. Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another heroic episode of Neil Before Pod. This edition has us talking about the recently released superhero team-up movie Justice League. To discuss this, I scoured the globe, but I didn't get that far, uh, to recruit my own Justice League. So with me is Chris. Hello. And Aaron. Howdy, hi. You can choose whatever member of the Justice League you want to be if you want. Or- Alfred. Alfred. Oh, I'm going to spend most of my time fixing tech problems. Uh, there we go. You got the best one already. I can't talk. <laughs> you could be Lois Lane. Could I? Could I though? If you want. <laughs> Men can be Lois Lane too. Something to aspire to. I don't know. No, but I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't live up to that. All right. Live up to what? That's a, that's a. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Aye. She, she only talks about the fact that she did that. What's she done lately? I made coffee for Martha. She did. And does fluff pieces. Uh, that's almost a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Uh, Justice League recently came out. Uh, a few days ago, actually. So we're right on the button for this, depending on when I edit this, when it's like six months from now and it's way late. So... I hope you enjoy the DVD release of Justice League for those that are listening when I finally get to post it. Anyway, uh, start as we always begin with spoiler free stuff. So, Chris, without spoiling anything for anyone, what did you think? Uh, I I really had my hopes up for this film. I really, really did. I was rooting for it. I didn't want it to be poor, but sadly it was. I was just really disappointed with a lot of the potential going into this, but the fact that it had sort of had all these ominous reshoots and things related to it, I was kind of expecting the worst, and then it arrived. So that's about as spoiler-free as I can go, I think. Cool. Aaron? I am not going to go so negative with it, actually. I cannot deny that this is a flawed film. Um, when it gets things wrong, it gets them really wrong, I think. However, that said, when it gets things right, I think it gets them really right. And it's a strange balance. And probably whether you'll enjoy it or not, in my mind, is whether you can get enough out of the good things to outweigh those negatives that, that, that Chris has talked about. Strangely, though, one thing that I did like about it talking uh one thing i did like about it was something that probably came about by accident because i know that the world and their dog loves wonder woman film and it's more comic style whereas i was really into the the much grittier films that came before it that weren't popular because they didn't have that comic book angle um, and I think this film strangely ends up somewhere in the middle, where it does have comic book elements, but it still is, obviously, that legacy of darker characters trying to exist in that world. And I, I appreciate that balance. I think if it could go on from here, I'd I'd be okay with that as a compromise, but I suspect that that was more by accident, given the late editing of everything and just ramming stuff together. But, But... If it does carry on, that would be good for me. Who knows how it will carry on. I don't think DC know how it's going to carry on at this point. So um, I'm somewhere in the middle. I thought it was alright. I gave it three stars when I reviewed it. I was entertained. Uh, I wasn't that disappointed because I wasn't anticipating it much. So there, I mean, there was parts about it that I thought were really good. And there's parts of it that I thought were pretty bad, which we'll definitely come on to. Um, both, both sides will be positive too. Hopefully, um, yeah, I thought it was all right. It's it's definitely not the landmark that it, de- it should be when it's you know the Justice League coming together on screen for the first time. Um, these characters are largely well known, some of them anyway, more so than others. And 
them coming together should be a bit of a big deal, but it kind of feels like it's not. So, the inevitability of the problems there is something that we're going to have to mention, but it's it's all over the internet, so we're not going to add too much new to it. But just as an opening comment, they were screwed. Uh, wh- whoever it was was left in charge of this hot potato at the end was utterly screwed with be- being able to come up with something genius. That's just not possible. Based on everything I've read, I think the people who ended up holding the baby at the end here should be glad that they were able to produce something that did have all the positive points that it did have. You know, they saved it. They didn't necessarily create an amazing film, but given the amount of hurdles people must have had to jump over, I think they should be proud that they did manage to, at least in my mind, save it. No, yeah, it's, it, it's a troubled production for sure, and the fact that we got something watchable out of it, if you deem it watchable, um, is remarkable. Uh, with everything that changed, all the mid-flight stuff they kept having to do, um, it's just a very strange production, you know. It, it's weird that something so cobbled together feels semi-coherent but somehow they manage it so um, I don't know, uh, I guess we'll get into more detail as we go um, unless anyone has anything else non-spoilery I could just launch us into the spoiler section and no, ready. launch us away ok, we're free now we're completely free and able to chat without spoiling it uh, or without worrying about spoiling it because people should know Okay, so since this film doesn't exist in a vacuum, uh, it exists relative to other films in the universe, whether it stacks up against them or not. So what are the thoughts on what we've had so far? So we've had four films, uh, including this one. So Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Suicide Squad, and then this one. Um, So what are the thoughts on those films? Uh, Aaron, you can go first. Uh, All of those films, right, okay. Um... Like the production of this latest film, you kind of get the impression that the entire universe is struggling. It's that problem of trying to catch up with Marvel and they're trying to create everything. It's everything we discussed on the other podcast, unfortunately. Suicide Squad tries to go in a different direction and seems to completely fail in all of its objectives. The 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 original direction that they tried to go in with with Man of Steel and Batman vs Superman was rejected by the mainstream of the audience and then Wonder Woman is suddenly everybody saying that's what we wanted all along give us just more of this film and that of course came too late oh, yeah. for people to Wonder really Woman. do anything about for this film but all of them are completely different, I think, in that's in, in, in they've all tried to do a different thing. And, and perversely, if you had like a suite of films like Marvel have got, where you've got, you know, double figure films, you can afford to try and do lots of different things. But it, it, it feels like with these ones, because they hadn't established themselves yet, it was sort of too early to try and do uh, a bit of each without establishing who you are at your very core to begin with, which is, which is a big shame because I think it's, it's not necessarily their fault, but you can't build a universe overnight, as we've said before. Yeah, I, I completely agree there. Um, all of the films are different. Um, Man of Steel is probably the purest one because I don't know of any kind of production issues it had. Uh, it was just kind of a film that they made to see how it would do. Uh, Batman v Superman we have an entire very long podcast about that which is um, you know my thoughts on it are mixed there's parts I like parts I don't there's issues I have with it and and things I think it does well Wonder Woman which I completely forgot to mention when I was listing these which is mental is uh, I would say my second favourite of the the DC expanded universe or extended universe whatever they decide to call it um just because I think it, it's two thirds of something really great, and then a third of invincible people hitting each other, you know, which has become quite tiresome at the moment. But so, what's your favourite? My favourite's Man of Steel. Oh right. Yeah, uh, Suicide Squad I think is atrocious. There's not nothing I like about that film really, very little. 
one or two little bits here and there that, that are okay, but on the whole, it's a train wreck and shouldn't have been made. The difficulty I think I have, though, with with even where we've ended up, is is something that I'm, I'm going to have to admit seems to be the opinion only of me and a few other people who are not going to be allowed out of the cupboard in the future, which is that I liked the way they were going with Batman versus Superman, that that dark, brutal universe, because it was completely different to what Marvel is offering us. And the danger, I think, of the future when we're, we're, we're seeing more of these more comic book style, pure comic book style films is that they're just going to blend in. And I would put money on the fact that people who are coming from the general public who weren't originally superhero film fans beforehand will not be able to differentiate the brands, DC versus Marvel. Now, I don't think I'm interested in preserving their brands in that sense, but I do think that separating themselves out could only have been a good thing. And I I don't think that's going to happen. I think once we start getting more films like Wonder Woman, they will blend together and then we'll just end up with a lot of superhero films and the, 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 the viewing public might get bored of the whole concept as a whole if people aren't careful. I think there will be a watershed moment coming up at some point. I think you're spot on with that. I've got to agree with a lot of what you said. I think the problem that DC's had is they've they've never sort of pinned their colours. They've never went, this is the way that we are going to do it. Um, Like you said earlier on, it seems that with each film they go, do you know what? The last one didn't quite hit home. We're just going to dabble a little bit and tweak a bit of this and a bit of that. And they come out with something different each time. Well, Wonder Woman, they kind of hit a sweet spot where people went, oh, we like this. This is a bit of what we're used to. We're like, we like this. And it did come too late for Justice League. And you can still see that there were tweaks, um, which I think are some of the elements that that maybe stopped Justice League from gelling somewhat in the middle is when someone's come along and went, oh, we've got to tweak this to make it slightly more Wonder Woman-esque. All right, okay, quick, tweak, 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 tweak. And then they, they come in and they change it all. I... I get what you're saying about differentiating themselves from Marvel and doing this more bleak, um, realistic isn't the right word because they're flaming superheroes, but, (laughs) you know, it it is a more honest take of, well, how would the public react if there was an invincible man who could destroy armies at a whim? floating about the place, then folk would be sitting there going, well, who's he to have this kind of power? Who who stands up to him? Who tells him what to do? No one tells him what to do. He's a loose cannon, you know. It's exactly how uh, our world would react now. Uh, it would just be done on Twitter. Um, but it's <laughs> it's one of those things. I, I, I kind of get that angle, but they've just never properly committed to it. If they were, if they were really going for this dark universe where everyone's bleak, Superman is suffering manic depression, then Suicide Squad should have been a different film. If if there was a film where they wanted to really go down the bleak angle of the baddest of the bad and isn't this world absolutely pants, then Suicide Squad is the, the is the the film that should have sort of properly stapled that in along with Batman v Superman and all that and, and they didn't. Well, they made I a, think I agree with that though, but that I think that would be the Suicide Squad film. Suicide Squirm, Suicide mm-hmm. Suicide Squad film that I would have wanted to see. This really sort of nasty, dirty dozen style film where it was actually officially a last ditched effort because of an immoral government. And if you'd have put that in place, there would have been so many links. If, if, you know, only into um, Don Trump alone, they would have. People would have been connecting these things. Oh, nasty government's doing this, that, and the other. But then if you also bring in this, as you say, this Superman who has a a UN-like perspective, but too much power to be trusted, again, we could have had links to to what's actually going on at the moment and these moral questions. And all of a sudden, your superhero films could have some commentary in the same way that we want science fiction to have and I, I, I think there is a place for that. I want there to be a place for that. We've said in previous podcasts how much I dislike having fun, but 
I do think that's not it. It, <laughs> it is just about, well, well what else can it do? That haven't been published yet. <laughs> well, whichever, yeah, who knows, time travel podcast. Is it now, is it later? You'll find out. But, <laughs> but the, the, the Marvel films have covered that angle, especially with Thor 3 that's just come through now, and they've really hit their comedy stride. Why not have something completely different? I mean, I know what the answer is. Not going to make enough money. And that's an utter shame. But the, the whole under, un, the underpinning point of some of the point of, of uh, Batman versus Superman, where, like I think I said on that podcast, there's one point where Superman phones his mum for help. It's this really human angle. And I see what you're saying. You know, of course they're superheroes. But it, it always supposed to come down to this human condition. Whatever is being shown is supposed to reflect on us and what we would do. And there you go. That's it. If you were put in charge of the UN and you had that much power and you could marshal the world's armies to try and make things better, what would you do? How would you do it? And how would you get past people's fears? That all seems so important that it would have been a valid question. And it's, it, I think it's a massive shame that we are teased with that and now we're going to lose it i think part of the problem is um so you've talked about dc's success relative to marvel and unfortunately that's how if not the people making it that's how the studio see these things so what they tried to do was batman v superman is largely defined by what it isn't rather than what it is so without so no one ever answered what it actually is and what it is supposed to be so it's almost like they never bothered to commit to a vision in the first place I mean Man of Steel itself a lot of people fixate on the the heavy city scale destruction and that is a part of it but throughout it's about Superman learning or Clark Kent learning about humanity and learning learning about hope as well you know it, it, it has a very kind of hopeful message to it that people seem to forget whereas Batman v Superman almost tries to establish itself as being essentially hopeless, at least until the end. Um, Suicide Squad, God knows what's going on. That's a Justice League problem with random criminals, guy with a gun and a girl with a baseball bat and things like that, trying to defeat hmm. a world-ending plot that I think the film has com- almost completely been decanonized since the events have not been referenced in Justice League, even though they might be. You know, See what you're saying there about... Um the, the loss of hope going into Batman versus Superman, to me, that was a very important part of it. He, he learns about hope in his own first film, A Man of Steel, and then he tries to bring that into the world, and the world has difficulty accepting it. And, and Batman is the other side of that. Bruce Wayne is the person that can't see that. But by the end of it, he's learned that lesson and the cost is the very symbol of that hope itself, which is his guilt going into uh, Justice League. So all of that, to me, seems to hang together so perfectly. Fine, you don't seem to get the full, heavy-hitting hope throughout the whole film, but you get the imagery of Superman being the next messiah constantly presented in his little scenes. I mean, to the extent that you can't miss them, where there, there are all these people reaching out to touch his cape, much as they were reaching out to touch Jesus' uh, clothes as well. I mean, how is that not still carrying over that symbol of hope? I, I, I honestly thought that was a good follow-up, and that was exactly what was needed to present this this purity then trying to exist in the real world. And that's, so it, that's what was built up, and I think that's what's going to be given away. And that's one thing that it does, but it also does all this other stuff. Uh, I mean, we discussed it at length, but it does all this other stuff like set up the Justice League, throw in Batman's backstory, and etc. It, it, it just keeps throwing things at you. The fact is, what you've got is a three-hour film that could have probably done in a lot less than that, and if they'd actually stuck to what they were focusing on. But it just seemed like it was a catch-up exercise, and we're still suffering the effects of that catch-up exercise. Well, I completely agree with that, that it's definitely the the film doesn't necessarily do what uh, it wants to do. But I'm still more talking about the universe itself, you know, the theme itself, whether the film does or does not work. I think they had built up this this theme throughout the entire background 
that really could have been meaningful. And if even if the films that have been successful and really got that across, I think we might still be losing it because of the apparent need, as you say, the production companies, we need to make money, the fans want, the, want, want to see more like Wonder Woman. So I think even if they'd have done those two films exceedingly well, we still would be losing it. And that, that's even more of a shame, maybe. If it made money, there would be no reason for them not to continue <clears throat> with it. I, I, still, I still think they're going to continue with it. I don't, I don't think they're going to back down, really. It's just the tone of the films that may change again. Well, that, that's what we mean. Uh, the, the, they're definitely going to continue making films, but the, the actual tone. So if Batman v Superman had resonated more in a box office res- respect, it didn't make... They didn't make enough money quickly enough for it to be considered a success, as, as I understand it. So therefore, it was deemed something of a modest success, which meant an in-flight change of, of something later on, you know. And it was being mm. changed as it was being made as well, which is, you know... I, d- uh, I do think that they just... You know, the DC people just don't seem to have the trust in the people that are making the films. And they go in and they meddle because they want what Marvel's got. And in doing that, they forget what they've built and what they have. I mean, the fact that they rushed to Suicide Squad, they rushed to Justice League, is is a bit disappointing because I think the payoff would have been better if you had been introduced to these characters already. In the same way I said in the Suicide Squad podcast, if we had seen these villains being taken down by The Flash and Batman and Aquaman and whoever then you would have went, oh my god, they're getting all these villains together. You know, and that would have been fun. In the same way that forming the Justice League, I think, would be better once you've been introduced to them. In a similar way to how Marvel did, you know, it it was the payoff after watching several uh, origin stories. The funniest thing is, Marvel don't even have... uh, Not Marvel. DC don't even have to look at Marvel to figure out... uh, you know, a proven way to do this. They can look in house. Mm-hmm. Their TV stuff, you know, regardless of what people think of it, has been a massive success. And the way they've built it has been gradual. It's been and it's been earned. You know, you, you start off with Arrow, which is very realistic, or as realistic as something can get about a guy in a green hood shooting people with arrows. But it's you know, it's a street level crime thing. And in the same vein that Marvel have done with Daredevil and things like that, although that came later. And then they introduced their version of The Flash on television and, and it's ballooned from there to the point where you'll just accept whatever they do because they've earned it because they've built it from the ground up. Whereas in the films, it's almost like, OK, you're just going to have to accept this now because that's what's happening. Which is where they have a problem with the small amount of background building they try to do in Justin League, Justice League. Actually, there's, there's seemingly no excuse for what they ram in for Aquaman here. It's utterly pointless. It's an entire waste of screen time because they don't manage to give us anything worthwhile. They just say, ooh, family trouble, very disturbed childhood, must be bad. Come back to the house of goodness and do good things again. And and you just switch off. I actually can't remember what that mer woman said. I just remember her constantly mentioning Aquaman's mum because it almost seems... It's where something that is normal almost seems ridiculous in the face of the completely fantastical that you're otherwise watching, but have completely accepted, because it it, it doesn't have a purpose. Uh, The funniest thing is that Bruce Wayne pretty much sums up everything you need to know about Aquaman in the first conversation they have. It's like, okay, we hear that you bring food to this village, and you're known as the Aquaman, and that you can talk to fish. That's everything you need to know for the purposes of this film. Yeah, I agree that his backstory would, you know... Obviously, you had the Atlantis sequence because one of the MacGuffins was there, fair enough. But you've also, uh, yeah, having this bit where he stops to chat to some woman we don't know. I mean, I know who she is because I know who these characters are and I can fill in the blanks. But, yeah, from from a persp- the perspective of the film, it adds nothing because it's like, hello, hello person I haven't seen in years, apparently. Uh, you know, your mother raised me. And it's like, who cares? It's not... There's no, it's nothing to do with anything else that's going on here. Why are we having this conversation? I, I do feel they, it's they a stole fan the box. Service. Go get it back. That that should have been the conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's 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 a bit of fan service. It's introducing characters that people know, and going, oh, tick, we had them there like that. We featured them. 
There we go. You know, that's that's all it is. Um, the strange thing and about the, that the expense of time in the film, you know. But the strange thing about that is, there's always Easter eggs in these films for the f- for the real fans to go and find. But like a proper Easter egg, normally they're little shots off camera uh, or at the edge of the camera, or they're just mentioned briefly and you move on. Or if it's reasonably blatant, like the wind up exploding penguins thing it's still over really quickly and and they're all so perfect for what they are and then all of a sudden they change that up by trying to have a a five minute chat and it it i just wonder why the the person who's in charge changed their mind at how they were doing these things when they were already doing some of them so well because aquaman comes out next year and they want to tease what that film might be about i think that's all that is but none of us, none of us who have who've, who who haven't read the comics will know who that is. Most of us in the audience will not have a clue who that woman was that Aquaman spoke to. He and spoke a to a woman underwater, and that's most of us will ever have gotten. Yeah, for in a better written sequence, it's that would be oh, what's all this about? You know, it's like like Black Panther in Civil War. You find out just enough about him to make you want to see a bit more of him. But in this, it's who's she? They don't even name her, I don't think. I don't think she's... Yeah, they, she hasn't given her name, which is Mira, no. by the way. Uh, she's like Queen of um, queen of Atlantis. But yeah, the, the film doesn't tell you that. And whatever, she might as well just be some random. It's apart from the fact that she's played by a recognisable actress, uh, Amber Heard. Yes. But beyond that, yeah, it's a bit pointless. Um, Barry Allen's has probably done better. I mean, it, it, it wasn't... It was, it was enough for you to know his situation and it, it didn't they had proper conversations and the two actors involved were a believable parent and child because there's a little bit i forget even what he says but where ezra miller has his head down and tells his dad never to say that to him again which is something that you believe a teenager would say yeah. and it's it's somehow seeing them in the middle of their lives that are already happening rather than Mira coming up and saying, here is all this information you already know that I need to say to you again for the purposes of people that we cannot understand. Whereas Barry and his dad have, yeah, a conversation that they would have in that circumstance. But it comes from the same writing team. You, yeah. So it, it's well, that same thing. Yeah. Get one right, yeah. one not. Yeah. Or is it, is it different people? I'd say. It could be. You, you have no idea whose hand was on which part of this film. That's the thing. No, no, no. No. It was too well. Joss Whedon came in for reshoots and things after Zack Snyder stepped down after a family tragedy. You know, which obviously you can't blame him for that. Like, if, if his daughter no, no. commits suicide, he's needed elsewhere. You know, so. Um, so I'll Joss pitch in with. In. <laughs> I'll pitch in with green screen underwater shoot is easier to redo than prison set. Just saying. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, but um, I don't know. Maybe that was the original Barry Allen scene. Maybe it wasn't. Who knows? But. What it does do as well for, for Barry is establishes why he's hard to find, even though that's established earlier when Alfred just tells you. But uh, it kind of gives you a list of everything he's doing and, and it's a tether to the it's a tether to his past, I suppose, that makes him that that's able to be exploited by Bruce to find him. Or exploited by Alfred. Bruce does bugger all in terms of trying to find people. Um Yeah, it's a good conversation, although People who have seen the TV show might feel it's a little bit familiar. Yeah, but you can't assume that people need to do their homework no. before they come and watch it. No. I mean, well, I, it is I, a, I mean, it is Grant awful. Gustin. So, yeah. No. So there's no need for... Yeah, Unfortunately, they're not marrying up the two universes. Which would be cool, but whatever. By contrast, I think they've done so well in establishing... And I appreciate they've had more time to do it, but in establishing a background for the Bruce Wayne character. And I know we've, we've spoken about this before in, in some of the, the potential assumptions that you might make with that, but I think there's an argument on the screen. If you compare the styles of conversation that you can show in Alfred and Bruce, again, people caught in the middle of an existing history... When Alfred says one misses the days when one's only concerns were exploding wind-up penguins, it's something that seems, again, relevant for the conversation they're in. He doesn't explain 
Do you remember, Bruce, when we used to fight the penguin? And he was a strange person and had all these whack... You know, he just cut straight into the comment. And that's the same with Barry. He cut straight into the comment. They managed to build that up. It's, uh, it is such a shame that they didn't do, they didn't manage to capture that with Aquaman. Yeah, and arguably they didn't, well, I mean, they didn't need to do that much work on Aquaman, I don't think. I think uh, as long as you get the impression that, well, you, you find out what his powers are, and that's essentially how useful he is in this film, and then what his, what his role in the film becomes is relative to his dynamic with everyone else, which is fine. Mm. You know, for a team up film, it's fine. I mean, the fact that you don't know who he is going in is a bit problematic, but that's the problem that the, dug themselves into because they've only previously established three characters um, with you know only two of well only two of them having their own solo films but as you've said in an action film they managed to give us everything we needed to know about Aquaman and then after that it seems perfectly reasonable to just let Jason Momoa do it because he was perfectly capable of getting on with it. You didn't need any more. He was, he was great, you know. Yeah, such great presence. And Aquaman is the, the frequently uh, made fun of um, DC character or just comic book character in general. Because the, the joke is that he sucks. You know, even if you've seen the Big Bang Theory, they're always making fun of him. And the Simpsons poke fun of him occasionally. And Family Guy, everything. You know, he's... he's supremely ridiculed so the fact that Jason Momoa through his performance essentially rescued that reputation is remarkable I think he did he did well I'm not sure about the whole sort of dude dude kind of thing with Aquaman I don't I don't quite understand but I'm sure we'll get all that in his solo film and then it'll all make sense yeah he's I suppose he's a bit of a bro it yeah, that I was that's the only. Yeah, that's. I was trying to think of a word, but yeah, that'll do. He is kind of a, a bro type thing. Like, I'm fine. It's it's a character thing, and I I think he did a good job with what he was given. He had a couple of little fun lines. I don't quite understand his power set and or anything, but um, and an amazing I'll look speech. To find out more. Let's not forget his amazing speech. <laughs> well, that that scene was quite good fun actually the little <laughs> gag with the the lasso i've got to give him some of that credit yeah and the, the lasso is good for that you know it's you can move the plot on by get, just getting people to fess up about what's uh what you know what's bothering them and i think um i think they should get a hold of one of those in the the flash tv show <laughs> certainly stop us wasting time but that's another podcast yeah, presumably with Aquaman, they're they're going to go down the the reasonably well trodden but not bad route of he's the rebellious prince who has to learn responsibility in order to reclaim and be useful to his kingdom which is fine then if you're going down this lad view he's he's very much the Henry V let's go out on the lash and have a laugh so oh, Thor. set up and it, it, Thor, it? it's it, I didn't want to say it because I, feel, I hate comparing it constantly to Marvel, but yeah, it's it feels like it. <laughs> it feels like that is the plot line that they are going to follow. I mean, and Thor is not going to be the first to take it. As I've said, as a reason I chuck yeah. in, yeah. you know, Henry V there. It's it, this is this is well trodden, but again, not bad for it. And if that's the way they go, they have perfectly set up the rebellious prince in in this film. Yeah, he's clearly he's clearly deciding which people he wants to help, and that's him. But yeah. Uh, arguably the experience of being in the Justice League has made him think differently, I suppose. I don't know. You see him swimming back to Atlantis in the, at the end, or this implied that that's where he's going. So that's the that's his arc, isn't it? It's about accepting that things, some things are bigger than the little corner of the world he's decided to protect. Well, as long as he's got food for thought to then build upon when his solo film gives him his own unique problem that only he can deal with then this introduction has done what it needs to do yeah, Batman's not finished his submarine yet so he can't help exactly yeah <laughs> um, yeah Aquaman was I liked Aquaman there's not much to him in this film but I think Jason Momoa fills in the gaps and he's a lot of fun to watch And you know his laddishness didn't really bother me um, I loved his speech his speech was just great you know and the um, yeah. I think it's a strange way of putting it. It didn't really bother you. I think it was... It, in what sense should should that have bothered you? In what sense could that have bothered you? You know, he was... he was. Ex I think he was exactly what you sort of expect from a 
really strong, but with no great purpose, almost rebellious younger man. I don't know how old, how old Jason Momoa is, but he, he plays somebody that you expect to see if they were extremely strong in terms of character as well as physical power, but but having that 20-year-old, nothing really much to do with it yet, don't have any responsibility yet. I, I wouldn't say it was in danger of being offensive. I thought it was, yeah. it was, it was, it was well placed. It's more of a personal thing. I've seen plenty of things where you have these laddie characters, and um, I just find the 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 way they're normally written to be quite offensive. And I think with, I mean, personally offensive, it just irritates the hell out of me. And I think there was possibly a danger of that with Aquaman, but maybe it wasn't featured enough for that to kick in. But I, I saying, can't. I'm a bit stunned that you've gone down that route actually when you've. Um, when you were loving the, was it Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy in his second film? He was totally laddish and horrific. He was a total bully, and I thought you really liked that. Not that he was a bully, I didn't mean it that way, but I mean, I thought you liked the way it was... He was very laddish and presented in in that stereotypical way. Yeah, um, I, th- I thought Drax was fine, um... I don't know. It may be more down to Dave Batista's delivery of the deadpan delivery that I don't know. I'd have to listen back to that, but um Yeah, I, Aquaman was fine for me. I think um he was fine. I don't really have much to add there. He was he was good. I think Cyborg's the only one missing. Um I'm not sure what thoughts I have on his backstory, actually. He seemed to be the total plot device rather than backstory. The literal like plot device. Yeah, well, yeah. Is it, I find that much trickier to get a handle on. He was sort of the Swiss Army knife slash utility <laughs> belt um, that they had at their disposal. The plane won't get there. I will, well, if I jack into it for whatever reason, I don't. I have no idea. Um, he, he did just seem a bit, like you say, a plot device. He was part MacGuffin for this, so I, I don't think he was served particularly well. He was a bit meh. My thinking on Cyborg is that he suffered the most from the reshoots and all the changes. So there's parts of the film where he's very self serious and and all that and tortured, and there's other parts where he's a bit more glib and. Um, just blends in with the, the the whole team dynamic a bit more, and it seems to change from scene to scene. Uh, you know, the bit where he says, "I was running the numbers while you were busy being an asshole." That's like a good example of how he's he, he's just part of the group. But there's there's other bits where he just he seems very distanced and, like as I said, tortured. So I think there was an issue there with them not quite establishing who he was supposed to be because so many things changed as they were making the film. Maybe there was some stuff that would have just been too expensive to abandon. I think maybe instead of managed to keep a consistency throughout, which, as you, as you, as, as you suggest, is almost impossible given what they were having to change, yeah. if they had managed to keep a consistency throughout, they would have opened with Dark and Tortured and then it would have been scenes like he had with The Flash there. Uh, grave digging, which would be so darkly horrible that it would have turned someone in Cyborg's position towards humour. And it's actually quite charming when they he make, when 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 the Flash makes the little joke, "Oh, we're the accidents, aren't we?" And you sort of think you can see in Ray Fisher's face where he realizes, "Yeah, we are." And there's this learning point he he bonds over that he realized he does have a place with these i'm reading a lot into it but i think you could see that progression happening if it went to really dark and brooding perverse black humor with the flash leading up to finally accepting proper humor at the end with a light-hearted superman that could have been a journey but with the with the reshoots, as you say, if it all got jumbled around and we didn't see that building from dark through to light, we we just couldn't appreciate it. It's what you want to see, but yeah. perhaps you yeah, can't. And I quite liked the idea that he was afraid of himself. You know, the, there's at least one part of the film where he loses control of his abilities, and that obviously terrifies him as well as everyone else around him. But they don't do anything with it. 
It's just yeah. something that's a problem for that scene and then doesn't really come up again, apart from when Aquaman says, I'm sketchy on you because you might be working with the enemy. Yeah, it's just that one that one scene, and I don't know if that was meant to play throughout and those scenes have maybe been cut, so you're only left with that one like at the worst possible moment uh, to suddenly decide to shoot <laughs> someone by accident. Yeah. He decides to do it. You know, I don't... It, it just seemed a bit weird for them to to throw it in for just that once. Does it describe in microcosm then the entire film based on these ideas that we're thinking they had to reshoot everything? It's something that somebody originally put in, but then somebody else came along later and tried to rebuild whilst leaving half of it behind. Because you've got those, that, as you said, you've got Cyborg possibly being a danger but then isn't. And then you've got Superman coming back from the dead, potentially broken, but actually he sort of isn't. And it's maybe it's this constant war throughout the film of these two ideas, and they couldn't ever be married anywhere, but somebody really tried hard. Yeah, I think from what I've read about the the production, um, Cyborg was supposed to be a very kind of dark, well, in inverted commas, dark character throughout. It was the idea that, you know, every day he was discovering some new ability that he couldn't understand. You know, the idea... I, I love the line about he has a language in his head that he doesn't speak. Um, it was just to show how terrified he is of what he's becoming and there's nothing it can do to stop it. And the fact that he just keeps hacking into stuff without really thinking about it just shows the loss of control. So I think maybe the through line was supposed to be him getting to that point where he controls himself and trusts himself but again as we said it doesn't quite work because too much changed and it was more about let's just make this a bit of a romp which isn't always a good thing I mean, you kind of even get that line from uh, the villain um, Steppenwolf about um, you know you'll come to understand the chaos so you'll come to embrace the chaos kind of thing I was expecting that to play out in a way that didn't so I think there's a few little bits that have sort of still been left over from what they were originally going to do with them yeah you always get hangovers from different versions of the film or different versions of the script and and things that get changed a lot and this film has a lot of them little little threads that just go nowhere you know you, know, you tug on them and things might unravel but um, it's just little I've... things left in here and there I feel it's a bit of a shame because the the reshoots and everything were so public and so out there. I think it means that people keep their when they're watching the film, especially if they know about them, they're looking out for them more. The fact that people know that Henry Cavill had a CGI <laughs> had to have his moustache removed by CGI means that folk are sitting there looking, going, "Is this the one where I get to see where they removed the moustache?" You know, well, and they're spending their time doing that. You know, it's it's one of those where. It's if if people hadn't been told, would they have been looking for it? And the same with different holes in the plot and little bits that seem to go nowhere. As people are always going, oh well, that's because of the reshoots, that's because of the rewriters, that's because of the different. And and some of these elements may have still been there in the original. It's just that because we're so aware of it, that you're picking up on more of them. There's an element of that, I think. Um, just onto the kind of mustache thing very quickly. Um, I don't think I would have necessarily known that's what they did, but if I was watching the film without knowing that you know about this ludicrous thing that they had to do for some reason, uh, because the Mission Impossible producers wouldn't let him shave off his mustache and wear a fake one for their film, which is you know which is one of the pettiest things I've ever heard. It has to be said, but anyway, um, I would have probably in those scenes noticed that something was wrong. It was like when. The way I think about it, it's like in Rogue One when I didn't notice that Tarkin was CGI, or I didn't know that they were going to do a CGI Tarkin. So when I was watching the the scene that he first appears, I was thinking, is something not right here? And I feel like yeah, that is an I element thought. of yeah. the uncanny valley kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I thought it, yeah. I was sitting there thinking, before I went to see the film, I'm not going to notice this CGI'd off mustache. The very first shot of the film. It was there staring, literally staring me in the face. I think I can honestly say, though, I did know about the moustache because I remember you telling me, but I didn't, I didn't even see it at all. So I think Chris is right with that. I, with, because I wasn't really thinking about it too much beforehand, I wasn't looking for it. 
I think I did manage to see front of the memorial there was a completely CGI'd Superman. So it's not like I didn't see anything at all, but I certainly wouldn't have had any knowledge of if we hadn't been talking about it now, there being a mustache, not mustache. I, that, that just, I just wouldn't have thought of it. And I'm pleased that obviously we've, we, we, we put, we're bringing that stuff in to this as a review because we're covering everything. That's the nail before blog style. It's a full discussion. But I do, I'm also going to be pleased if we can bring in other parts of this film to our review, as I think we've already done here, because some of the reviews I've seen on the internet and even on the BBC, all the reviewer has been able to say is problems in production causing this, that and the other to create this, that and the other in the film. And all of those reviews have been so lazy because they've just taken what they already knew, as Chris says, and just played it back. And you think, well, there's no point in you then. Go away. We've paid you for nothing. I think we've managed to go beyond that here. I do think we need to mention it, but I'll say I would prefer, I would definitely want to see more of that in some of the things I've seen uh, from some people who get paid more, you know, well, get even paid to do what we're doing here. Yeah, I think um, I think there's a lot of merit to judging the thing that you're looking at in front of you. And ultimately, you know, whether I knew about the moustache or not, I noticed something was up. Um, there was something about it that looked wrong to me. And, and this happened throughout. I mean, we'll come up to that when we talk about action sequences in more detail. But in, like we said about the cyborg thing, there's just little bits and pieces that don't quite add up. But, you know, we... We obviously, we talk about these things a lot, we write about these things, etc. So the thing is, we are maybe a bit more attuned to looking for little hiccups in the story that don't quite add up, because those are the things that essentially make or break an analysis, aren't they? Um, you know, this A leads to B leads to C, but it doesn't quite do that in this case and whatever else. So, yeah, I think um, I've seen a lot of critique that's just been like, yeah, it's a victim of production problems and stuff. And it's like, well, okay, cast that aside a minute. What is actually in front of you here you know what is good or bad about the thing that's in front of you and it can be hard to separate uh, what you've read from what you're watching because it's just so they're, they're so intertwined in the way that you, we consume media at the moment you know you can in theory you can watch this film you can watch the trailer for the next film you can read the comics read the wikipedia page that about this film you can do this all on a single device pretty much so it's hard to separate out. Well, the... I think... Well, it is. It, it totally is. I mean, because I, I, I can't say as I haven't had the issues myself, but, you know, th- I'm, one thing I'm really surprised at that I've not seen so far, and that's probably just because I haven't read the entire internet, obviously, but I haven't <laughs> seen much yet of people commenting on the fact that it was pretty much Harvey Weinstein behind the camera at certain points, you know. And I I use that on purpose, even though it makes this a bit of a contemporary uh, label. But if it's that obvious, why weren't people commenting? I mean, and they, they, they were so blatant. There's the bit where Mira has to swim up to the camera on purpose. I mean, she leads chest first as she approaches the camera. It's, and it, it's so blatant. And there's another scene where they're, they're showing Bruce getting off the plane and the camera literally rolls up uh, Gal Gadot's legs up to her backside and stops. And you're thinking, how did you get away with that? I mean, normally when you're doing some of these shoots... It's a matter of cleverly positioning the camera so you accidentally get a shot of something jolly good, you know. But here it's just like, you know, screw it, mate. Just put the camera behind her ass and get on with it. Linger, linger, <laughs> linger some more, please. And <laughs> honestly, if with what's, especially with what's going on at the moment, with, with pr- probably even some of these very actresses saying how they've been mistreated, and and here, I haven't seen that in reviews. I've seen people lazily saying, oh, production problems or cutting problems. You know, how did they miss such an obvious and blatant play on the audience and, and mistreatment of the, of the female acting? And maybe one of those instances could be forgiven as they didn't catch it, but there was more than one. 
Oh, that was it was uh, it's very noticeable considering uh, what they achieved by doing Wonder Woman to then come to this, and you're like, oh, they've just taken the step back again. Well, the Amazon and, the, the Amazon yeah. women are all fighting in like battle bikinis, you know, which is not what we're fighting in in Wonder Woman. Yeah, so that's, I mean, you know, good, that's one thing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's they're suddenly it's one wearing of those video things, game yeah. armor, you know, the stuff that doesn't they're, really protect you but is very revealing on women. Yeah, there there, there are those issues. Strangely, as well, it's this. It's this mis- this misplay of things coming together as well. There's one thing I noticed that they did do well in this film, which was they seemed to have some women in who were, I, I don't actually know how much, but potentially bodybuilding women. Because the, the, the two that they had holding up the door so that the queen could escape, you could see actual muscles on these women. And I thought, good God. They've actually bothered to go out and get some people who could be Amazons rather than just getting pretty well. girls to dress up in, in, in not very much. Yeah. And so, strangely, they somehow seem to get some things right whilst immediately making all the common problems that we've already n- know and expect from laziness and uh, uncaring nature. It's a crazy mix throughout. Yeah. I mean, they seem to make a, a slight effort to make Wonder Woman the leader of the Justice League, but at the same time, because it was Bruce that was kind of bringing them together, it didn't quite feel like that. And I don't know if that's what they they were aiming for in the first place, is that a Wonder Woman's leading the Justice League, or is Batman leading the Justice League? Gal Gadot herself... I was actually okay, okay with that because of the mm. development of it. Yeah. They're the two experiences. Um, but the development, though, isn't there? Because they've managed to produce a, a, a Bruce Wayne, a Batman here, that has a history. And I do think they've established that. He has been doing this for 20 years. He's, he's the one who has got the experience where some of the others have either hidden away or are really new to it. But he's recognizing that he can't hack this. He can't do it all. He's, he's not physically strong enough for it. And he's... He's also, as he very rightly says, he is less human in a way than Superman was. So when it comes to Wonder Woman, who he also calls out and says, look, you're pretty much the same sort of creature here as Superman was. You could be the symbol of hope. I think I was okay with it from that perspective because he was almost trying to lead her into it. He was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm passing some wisdom onto you here for you to use. You've got everything you need mostly, but you need a, an extra little push. And it wasn't like a total mentor relationship, which he had with Barry Allen. Certainly, certainly the flash was master and student, uh, master and student. That was, uh, but that was also well done. Yeah. It was, it was an advice. I think you need some advice here and I can push you into that final little step you need to take. And then you can be, this devastating leader that this group needs. Yeah, he's almost, they're almost peers, and that's the way Gal Gadot put it. And I think that's right. I think they they are on an even footing, but they have different, they have different problems. Um, Batman's problem being that he's a bit too old for all this, you know, cue the Danny Glover quote, but, um, which I won't say. Uh, so he's, he's getting a bit too old for it, and he's recognised that he won't be able to do it alone or do it forever, whereas, you know, Diana could. She could do it, well, forever, certainly, maybe not on her own. But um, And there is the definitive arc for Wonder Woman as well. She starts off with, you know, she starts off with stopping that hostage situation in London and then leaves, whereas at the end you see her hanging around to talk to people. And is it, I think it's little girls she's talking to, uh, hanging around the crime scene for some reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, while the, while the guys are confessing all their crimes with the, 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 they've got the lasso wrapped around them. Which is, you know, just again another good gag involving the lasso. But yeah, I yeah. mean, I, I do, I do think. I mean, a lot of people. I know there's massive Batman fans out here that will, that will hate me for saying this, but Batman is just a man. And when it comes to these god level threats that are that are appearing, these world ending threats, Batman is not the guy. You you need Superman, you need Wonder Woman, you need the Flash, you know, Aquaman to an extent in this. Um, I think if you're a real it's, Batman it's, fan, actually, like I'm going to have to say I am, you actually are not upset by that statement. You embrace it. That's one of the reasons I like the character, because he is a human. Mm-hmm. you know. And I, they do that well in these films. I, I'm really disturbed by all this 
talk that Ben Affleck will will leave because I honestly think he's one of the best Batman live. It's certainly the best live action Batman I've seen. But he gives you that. He is someone who is human, who recognizes as human. He can play with the big guns because he's found a way to use his intelligence. And let's face it, that is exactly what we want to see with Batman. Yes, it's cool for him to beat the crap out of a room full of 20 people. Fine. But the real essence of the character is someone who, well, I say the real essence, the guy's been developed for however many decades, but from the perspective I learned when I was a kid watching the cartoons, he was somebody who used his intelligence first. He can play up on this level because he is just that smart. And I I definitely appreciate what they did with that here. I think they make use of it with the interactions with all of the other characters. Maybe not Cyborg. I don't think he interacts much with Cyborg. But the way he interacts with all the other characters is is very human, very purposeful, very controlled, uh, and very well done. Well, speaking of someone that's not a huge Batman fan, I don't mind the character and. For me, it largely depends who's handling them. So the thing is, I'm I'm never a fan of that version of Batman who can defeat anyone. You know, the the argument that people always give that with enough preparation, Batman can defeat anybody. I don't necessarily believe that. But I quite like this version who knows his own limitations. And the um, animated series version, the animated film versions, you know, all these, they're kind of... They're very capable and they're very confident, but they also understand the need for some kind of contingency plan and the fact that things won't always work out your way, you know, and this, that's what the Ben Affleck version is. He's very, he's very pragmatic. He's, you know, he makes plans and he understands that they won't necessarily work. The big one being the Superman resurrection thing that goes horribly wrong in ways that he doesn't anticipate. Um, I I like it when he's fallible, which he isn't always portrayed as in, in various media, which is a shame. Yeah, I've got to agree. I mean, I I quite like it. That's why I had to put the disclaimer in the front. I know that there's some people that, like you say, think Batman could take on absolutely anyone and win. No, he can't. The, and I like the, the fact of any that the version, isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The guy that just because I'm Batman. Batman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's exactly that. It's it's one of these things that no, he couldn't. He'd he'd be he'd be completely beaten. And this this character shows it. And, uh, you know, you even get the his little sort of humorous line. He goes, yeah, definitely bleeding somewhere. Um, you know, and also you go, when they get Superman just literally throwing a limp Batman over his shoulder. <laughs> oh, yeah. You have, you have three hours worth That's of That's the classic part of that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a three-hour film about how they fight each other. And in this one, Superman just tosses him aside without a second thought. But the, the interesting thing is, like, if you, I mean, if you put Batman against Superman, then obviously neither of them will win because, you know, that people like both characters. But the thing is, in universe, Batman could be have an edge because Superman won't kill him, you know, because because of his morality. But you know, if he was to fight like General Zod or something like that, he probably wouldn't have a chance. Just a thought. He'd be nuked from orbit. It's 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 one of those. It's <laughs> he has a nuke now. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, he has a nuke now. Yeah. The, the, one of the whole one of the things I've always had a bit of trouble with, in fact, in some of these superhero films, is that um, <laughs> natural desire to see the good guys fighting each other. It's like the origin of things like Civil War. Oh, what would happen if Wolverine fought the Hulk? You know, I mean, amazing. You know, and some of these things are they get built up to far more than they should be I think Iron Man versus the Hulk I remember that there was some stuff that happened some city blocks got flattened there was a big suit of armour I think but ultimately was it such a big deal it was it's better in Batman versus Superman because it had a a, a purpose um, but then strangely when it came to this film I think I did actually really enjoy, and I don't know why, because I don't know why I should enjoy it, but I did actually really enjoy seeing every one of them go against Superman uh, in Justice League. It it was a strange moment where, for somebody who rejects saying, that was so cool, I have to say, that was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was a good sequence, and uh, as we talked about offline, I suppose, um, 
the bit where Barry's running at him and then he turns his head at the same speed. And I love that. Like, oh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> he can see me. Yes. What's going on here? That was part of um, Ezra Miller's delivery there. I think there's, there's one of the reasons that I find him to be a, a, an amazing flash, which is possibly his delivery, possibly the writing or both, was just that level of uncertainty, that, that complete convincing the audience that he's never done this before. You, know, you guys have all fought battles before. I have never fought before. You know, I forget what the line is, but the, that scene where yes, he, he realises... Yeah, right. he, he realises, oh my God, I'm going up against Superman here, and I'm screwed! You know, but they're perfectly done in pure fear on Ezra Miller's face. Yeah. And that, that scene was quite cool, because it shows that just Superman is a match for every single one of them, all at once. I mean, um, they still haven't properly established Wonder Woman's power level, I suppose. Because uh, it seems to fluctuate throughout, but um, even she, well, she had trouble with with Superman. Oh, she could take more punishment than any of the others could. I think I'm. I'd, I'd be happy if they don't make her the standalone punch for punch exactly as powerful as Superman, for the simple reason that I want them to be different. If if they go down the route and make her essentially a female Superman which they've already kind of hinted at with, with Bruce talking and saying, you are both the hope of the people. It, it would be a bad thing for her to suddenly be made a female version of him. So I think they should keep her power level lower than Superman's and then give her other things. Make her the leader. Make her more of a strategist. She is. She's been raised by the Amazons, people capable of conducting war like a almost like a samurai that they learn it from birth and they live it i'd rather she came out more like a general than superman who is very much a frontline soldier in that metaphor where he's very much civilians in danger off i go you know he just responds to that immediate threat i'd, I'd rather than then step up with with uh, with wonder woman and have her capable of playing on a different field and, and not make too much of a comparison of them yeah, it's difficult. I, th- I don't know what um, their actual plans for both characters are, I suppose. Uh, I think in this film they were they were distinct enough, certainly, and they didn't fight for long enough for you to get an impression of how powerful she is relative to Superman. You know she could take a couple of pits from him, but beyond that, not sure. I think this is similar to what we said about Batman v Superman and the fact that in this none of them want to hurt Superman. <laughs> yeah. They're trying to get him to stop so that they can they can sort of put their, their way across and sort of sort him out and make sure that no one else gets hurt, but they're not particularly trying to take him out completely. I think I'd be disappointed though if that was the reason that in the end she held back. I think that would be disappointing because in in this sort of superhero genre you can fire lasers directly at somebody and they don't get burnt skin. You know, they just get knocked back. You know, you can hit somebody as hard as you like and there's no such thing as a, a broken tooth or somebody having to reset their jaw on, on a superhuman. They, I mean, they had to put um, Batman's arm back in his, in his shoulder joint but very much because he was a human. You know, he suffered that because of how he that he wasn't a superhero. So I would expect them to quite happily be able to have two superheroes going toe-to-toe in a fight and be able to use their full comic book strength because the rules of comic book will protect them. That, that's, got, that's got to be mm. used. The physics of the universe, you can't just... Well, I don't, I don't want them to just change the physics of the universe because they want to make a point. And, and I'm basing th- this entirely on the comics, but Wonder Woman is one of the few people on Earth who could match Superman in a fight. But I think that, and that's fine. That's where the comics came from. And once you've got a million characters, you're not so worried about these 
comparisons because there's just so many people. There's only so many times you can come up with another superpower. Oh, what can this guy do? Um, he can make lifts appear whenever he wants. You know, that, that's, we'll just run out of powers. You know, so, yeah. so comparisons are just going to be inevitable. But here, there are six of them. There are going to be more. I, I admit there's also Suicide Squad, but equally we're going to be comparing these people to just these six. And it seems reasonable to do something, and I'm going to be comparing against Marvel till I die, day I die, I suppose, but you've got the Hulk versus Thor, and you had them going at each other, and we very much had Thor can stand it in a ring with the Hulk. But the Hulk, when he hits Thor, is the only creature that can make the God of Thunder bleed. But actually, the God of Thunder was okay with that. You get that sort of smirk from him when he takes that first hit. But he can take it. I'd like them to keep that sort of power level, I think. You know, yet Wonder Woman can take a direct punch from Superman. But if it was stood toe-to-toe, and then just punch each other one after the other, what does it really matter if Superman would win that, you know? Let's keep them different. Yes, yeah, so what? He's a bit stronger than she is. He's got a bit more endurance. It's better that way. Define them. Separate them out. And, yeah, who cares if one of his abilities is better than hers? It shouldn't make her a lesser character. No, it shouldn't make her a lesser woman, female character because of it. It should have nothing to do with that at all. No, and the problem is if you've got Superman and Wonder Woman who are equivalent one power levels on the same team... Why do you need the rest of the team? You know, the, the, this film t- goes some of the way they establish. Well, Superman has all their powers, right? You know, except maybe Batman's intelligence, though. Again, some versions of the comic character of Superman have that intelligence too. So there's. Yeah, Superman could essentially do whatever the Justice League does, more or less. Um, so you need to have a kind of reason for them all to be there rather than. You know, there's just someone here collect like. <laughs> for spare parts, you know, we, we have six chairs, so therefore we need a sixth guy. You know, that's that's what you want to avoid. Uh, and I, I mean, they do a good job of that. They make everybody kind of useful in their own little way. They do make everyone useful, but in that final fight against Steppenwolf, Superman comes in and handles him one-handed and completely floors him, whereas the rest of them have been at him the whole time and have been unable to do a thing. Be able to make an impact. Yeah, I suppose that tells you because Wonder Woman struggles with him. Yeah. One, Wonder Woman struggles completely with him. You've got the Flash in there. You've got Batman in there. You've got Aquaman in there. No, they can't take him down. Superman comes in and one punches him, and then that's it. It's it, and then he goes off, <laughs> does something else, comes back, treats him for a little bit more, and then that's it. He 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 completely takes out the the main villain in that. Whereas the others couldn't, it just couldn't make an impact whatsoever. You've seen them take on the Amazons. You've seen them take on uh, the people in Atlantis. They then do the fight there. It doesn't get taken. But Superman manages to come in and basically one punch them out the way. I think that's a problem with the writing of the ending, though. There's not really an mm-hmm. intelligent ending there where everybody's. Is, is used... No, normally what they do is they just line everybody up against their own perfectly chosen villain, as if the physics of comic book universe says for every proton superhuman there must be an electron superhuman to cancel them out. But in this, they, they don't even go down that route. They'd have been better off having some somebody make some choice, sacrifice, or intelligent deduction which enables them to then defeat the villain... So, I, I, so I'm, 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 definitely, I'm sure that's not a problem with Superman's power level. It's just that in the end, all they've really got to finish off was a big fight scene. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we might as well just chat about the villain now. Uh, I think Steppenwolf was one of the worst comic book villains in, in quite some time. There's, there is absolutely nothing to him other than the fact that he wants to destroy the world. And I don't understand why he needed to be CGI, since he's just essentially a big guy. I mean, is there any reason that they couldn't have had a, a physical presence of some sort, rather than just squaring up against some kind of bland CGI creation? I mean, I like CGI stuff. I think CGI is a very useful tool uh, in filmmaking, especially for films like this. But there's a time and a place, and I don't think creating this entire character that could have been created practically was, was necessary. 
Here, here's something that I was thinking about recently, though, which is, again, a connection to this idea of a darker universe. I think the original idea of there being uh, this, a grittier background where everything's a bit more horrible would have worked with a Steppenwolf that was a force of nature. Because, again, it would come back to this idea of what would you do if somebody came at you and you had no ability to stop them? It, you could draw a metaphor to you're in a war-torn Civil War country and you are the villager and the terrorist comes around the corner with a gun. You lose. There's, there's nothing you can do about that. They will either kill you or they'll enslave you, and it's over. You, the world has presented you with a situation in which there is no great win condition. And how do you handle that? What makes you have some sort of strength of character or ability to self-sacrifice that gets you past that? And Steppenwolf could have been that. He could have been this true evil that was just beyond humanity, there is... Why is he doing this? Because he wants to. Because he can. He's a warlord. He's a petty warlord who's been given infinite weaponry and told he's allowed to use it. What do you do? And so then you've got the the humans and the the superheroes have to find a way of dealing with that supreme evil from their perspective. But when it then turns and it wants to be more of a, a slightly light-hearted thing, but you've already set up true evil. I'm not saying that this is what they're originally aiming for and Steppenwolf was going to be this great villain and we've lost it. But I'd like to present the fact that it probably could have been better. It, it could have been a humanity against force of nature problem where they have to find an intelligent solution. You can't punch down the tsunami as it comes towards your village, but maybe you can do something clever to get out of its way. And that, that might have been a really good ending, you know, that could have used this force of evil but in, in a better way. Yeah, I hadn't really considered that. I just, I just saw Steppenwolf as this kind of bland, poorly developed excuse to get the Justice League together. In the same way that, you know, Malekith in Thor 2, which is, you know, Aaron's favourite film of all time, Narf. is uh, <laughs> is just kind of there for... Well, I don't know, he's just there. But the, there's nothing interesting about him, and there's nothing interesting about Steppenwolf either. He just mm. shows up looking for three things, and when he gets those three things together, bad things happen. And that's it. There's nothing more than that. It is very... Com- Comparable to sort of Malekith, where you don't sort of get the idea that there's actually a plan there at all. It's I have been banished for years because of these boxes, and I was waiting for the opportune moment to come back and put my three boxes back together again. I was waiting for Superman to die, even though there was decades of you not having a Superman. Yes, I, I, I waited. I waited six thousand years or whatever they said, and 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 now's my time. Not like that time before where there definitely wasn't any Superman or anyone else about that was going to do this. No, 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 no. Now, now is the time. Because I, I don't know. It's, it just seemed very, very clunky. And like you say, it's an excuse to bring the Justice League together, which is, you know, fine. Okay. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll go with that. I'm, I'm looking forward to a very similar film where some villain comes to unite several things together to destroy the uh, Earth. Yeah. But the thing is, if you com- I mean, if you compare it to the Avengers, which is the other big team-up film, you know that, that people will undoubtedly compare this to, and it's unavoidable. Uh, you've got the the whole concept of Loki as a villain, who, you know, and the Avengers has essentially maniacal warlord with disposable henchman type scenario. But the difference is, Loki is a character; he's not just a function of the plot. So uh, Loki has relationships to pretty much all of the Avengers. You know, he has scenes with every single one of them, I think. Mm-hmm. Except Bruce Banner, he doesn't have a scene with him. Although he has a very a very memorable mem- scene with the Hulk. Memorable you know, with one with Hulk, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, there's, so there's that. So the thing is, Loki is someone who gets under their skin, someone they can, they can put a face to this whole alien invasion plot. And Steppenwolf just doesn't do that. The only scenes he shares with the Justice League are when he's fighting them. And there's that kind of... Um, 
back and forth between him and Diana because they, or she knows of him. And I suppose Aquaman kind of knows of him as well, but they never have a, anything to do with that. No, he, he just seems a bit... He's he's what they need to be a big enough threat to have to bring Superman back and give them that excuse. He wasn't someone that could have been handled with them alone. But apart from that, he just seems a bit surplus to requirements. He's, he's a disposable villain, not particularly memorable for anything. He doesn't get any nice big grand speeches. He just goes about talking about mother a lot. <laughs> that's that's it. And then even in the end, the fact that, oh, now now he's scared, and then his henchmen turn against him, and that's it. That's it, they're gone. <laughs> I just didn't quite follow. But I don't know the... I have not read many DC comics, so I don't know how big a villain he is in the in the comic book canon. Maybe you can enlighten me a little bit, Craig, but uh, I don't know if he's meant to be some big bad that was really, really... that you know fans of the comics would be looking forward to seeing on screen, because if so, I think they might be a little bit disappointed in that. Yeah, I won't go into too much detail, um, because it would bore the living piss out of you. <laughs> but, uh, Steppenwolf is this cosmic being and he's a uh, dark side if you know who dark side is uh, and if you don't then there'll be a link in the show notes just click on that and it'll tell you exactly who dark side is but he's a yeah he's the essentially the marvel the dc equivalent of thanos um and steppenwolf is actually his uncle and there's this whole thing about like the new gods and apocalypse and it's all this like really cosmic space opera stuff that's you know if played right could be quite interesting and and I'm not sure how they could have done it for the purposes of this film, but I think there was more there that they could have dug dug into if they really wanted to, which they just choose not to, I suppose. And I don't, I can't imagine any version of this film where Steppenwolf was interesting. I don't think he was ever going to be the focus. I think he was just there as a means to an end to get the team together, and then they all fight him, and that's the end of it. I don't think there was anything ever more interesting going on there. I might be wrong. And if Zack Snyder or Joss Whedon wants to correct me on this, then feel free. That'd be an interesting conversation. I think I, even I, I think even if you had been yeah, you have a little bit for me without without spoilers. I will be clicking on the show notes later. <laughs> um, the, I, I I don't know. I've, I I kind of agree with Aaron a little bit that maybe if he had had some uh, our disposable villain had had some uh, disposable henchmen of slight matches to your um, Justice League to take out one at a time. It might have given each of them something to do and sort of shown their power set a little bit more. Um, but I don't know. Other, otherwise, just a bit meh. <laughs> again, yeah. Yeah. And to compare it to the Avengers again, I mean, the... The whole pro- point of the first Avengers film is bringing the team together. So the, at least the first half of the film is them essentially squabbling and fighting with each other. So that establishes their power set and how they are, how they perform relative to each other. But this, I mean, this film takes a different route, which it should, and which it, I'm glad it did, uh, of them essentially not fighting at all. They just kind of, Batman recruits them and then they get on with it which is fine, but then there's no other way of compensating for the fact that you don't get a real sense of their powers and all that stuff. So one of my favourite um, little bits is sort of, uh, you know, Ezra Miller standing there going, oh, you're forming a team. Oh, you're going to fight a villain. I'm in. Uh, it's just, well, great. It's like that kind of cuts through all this, oh, will I, won't I? Mm, maybe not. You know, considering that's what you get from the other two, you know, you get from Cyborg and um, Aquaman. I thought it was neat to have someone sign up right away on the spot going, yes, I need friends. I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the recruitment stuff, I mean, we, we've kind of talked about their backstories and how they're introduced and stuff. And the, the recruitment scenes, and I felt like this was a problem with the film in general, and it could be a production thing, but even if not, then whatever. But it's one of those things where it seems to be played for, let's, do, let's play this scene for exactly what we need to get out of it and absolutely nothing else. So Bruce Wayne recruiting Barry Allen is a scene where he storm, storms up, recruits Barry Allen, then the film moves on. You know, the, the scene where Aquaman decides not to join the team. That's the point of that scene. 
and nothing else, and so on. And it keeps doing this throughout until, so it kind of robs the, robs the interactions of any kind of depth that, that would let the the dynamic between two characters or three characters breathe a little bit. I think I disagree with that from a certain perspective. I completely agree with it from the perspective of the early film. At the very start, where they're doing, as you say, the recruitment, it it is seen, 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 and it's noticeably so. Somebody has hacked them together, and they very much live, as they say, to perform the purpose that they need to. But I think it does calm down, because there are then later scenes where people are talking for the purposes of the characters, not through the plot. And I'll raise one of those as an example that I've already said before. The scene where Cyborg and the Flash are essentially grave robbing, digging up Superman's body, there's there's no need to see them digging up more dirt. That is not serving Steppenwolf plot... It doesn't further the idea that we're digging at the body. We already know we're digging at the body from the previous scene. What that serves is to bond those characters because they bond over that line. Oh, we're the accidents then. And Cyborg gets potentially what could have been one of his first real laughs. So that's a real character moment. And they linger on that scene not too long. They linger on it just enough to get that joke out. And I didn't feel like that was the same as the early points I, th- I thought that was cut slower with character building in a way that the early scenes really weren't. Yeah. Um, I do like that scene. I think, uh, I think it's one of the few kind of... I mean, yeah, the film is very short, that's the thing. So you've got half the film that's kind of blazing through and then the half where it does slow down a little bit here and there. So the the other scene is uh, that's a good character one is that one that you already talked about as well, the bit where... Uh, Bruce Wayne says to Diana, "You, you could be a beacon of hope." And then, um, well, that's a source of conflict because she shoves him. And then, once she's putting his arm back in the socket, that's the bit where she reflects on it. So, the, specifically, the reflection scene is is interesting in that respect because it is the fact that she realizes that she's kind of half-assing it in a way. Um, but I do, I, I do think it just kind of rushes through a lot of. Er- certainly a lot of the early stuff and it kind of robs it of what it could have been I mean, the the setting of Barry's recruitment was really interesting it was a really cool looking room that he was in with all his computer monitors and the flash suit sitting there so even just spending a little bit more time in there learning a bit more about Barry would have been would have been good for the film you know? I think it would be okay if they just put more little moments in, like uh, is it is it Batman v is it Batman versus Superman where we get the shot of Bruce walking past a vandalized Robin's outfit? Um, yeah, is that, when I, that that's a lovely little moment that whoever wrote that trusted us, the audience, to take something from it without having Alfred come up and say. Uh, Bruce, are you reflecting on when Robin used to be your partner and then something bad happened? You know, they didn't need to put that in. They just let the history of the character be there. And some more like that, as you say, with with, with the Flash and his, his little uh, z- zone of order. I'm not sure what his little, his little Flash cave, I don't know what it was, but <laughs> they, could, they, could have, yeah, they could have given us a few more of those things in there Certainly in place of what we've already discussed, the blatant exposition that was Atlantis. Maybe maybe instead of that, Aquaman could have swum past some meaningful uh, setup, some statue of his... A statue of his mother would have served equally well of him looking on it and you thinking, why is he so hung up on this one woman? There's like a hundred statues here and he stops in front of this one? Why would he do that? And leave it as a mystery... Those sorts of things could have been much more powerful and used to create those little moments that you want in a way that the film has already said it can, or certainly the universe has said it's capable of doing, but strangely drops every now and then for reasons that I can't quite fathom. 
Well, I mean, the reason is it had to. Warner Brothers issued a mandate to get this thing in two hours. Yeah, well, and, fair enough. Uh, yeah, and they did by hook or crook. They managed it within. Well, I mean, if you include credits, it's probably something like 105 minutes or some nonsense like that, yeah, which has yeah. got to be the shortest team-up superhero movie ever made outside of an X-Men film. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's it definitely shows there that you know I would have liked a little bit. I would I wouldn't have minded watching it for an extra 10 minutes or so just to just to flesh these little bits out here and there, you know, just yeah. give us a sense of who these people are relative to each other and relative to themselves. And, you know, give me a reason to watch their solo films other than the fact that I'm a comic book fan, so I'm going to anyway. You know, the the thing is, well, as you said, you have no reason to be interested in an Aquaman film because it doesn't do anything to, to do that. Um, a, a little bit about The Flash, it's like, oh, his dad's, appro- you know, dad's accused of murdering his mother. That's an interesting backstory. Uh, ignore the fact that I've seen that play out in a certain way in the TV show because this will almost certainly be different uh, to some extent. So um, there's no real the new character certainly. I mean, I've no reason to want to see a solo cyborg movie, which will definitely never get made. But well, it's one the of the ones that's promised, isn't it? That's the the weird yeah, I think thing. It's changed now. Again, all right, okay. I mean, it's it's one of those. I mean, I I agree with you, and I, I would like to see some more sort of cleverly done scenes, like you're saying about like doing a statue or something like that. I have the feeling that if there is a longer cut here, it won't be clever stuff like that. What it will be is more of the Aquaman scene uh, run out for each character getting an extra bit of exposition um, thrown at you, you know. And yet, just today, I did see on the internet something along the lines of fans want to see editors long cut or something or other. They want to see Zack Snyder's original cut, yeah. Oh, the original, oh, I see. Uh, whatever that is. But I'm pretty sure that those people that want to see Zack Snyder's original cut don't want to see Zack Snyder's original cut, because that's what people were complaining about in the first place. Because well, the original cut is more akin to Batman v Superman than it is anything else. All right, I want to see that cut then. <laughs> Can I see it? Screw the, screw <laughs> no the rest of you. Yeah. I mean, there's the earliest trailers would suggest a, something more akin to that, I think. Yeah. Um, whereas this is it's definitely been retooled as it's been going. and um, I'm more into this particular tone than I am any previous... Then I would be the Batman v Superman style tone, you know, especially, especially after Wonder Woman being amazingly optimistic and things like that. But then, if you had Batman as the source of pessimism in the film versus Wonder Woman, who's the source of optimism within the film, then that could be a really cool little clash. You know, you have these two characters that understand who they are and they they clash over it, and maybe their leadership styles don't match up. Well, the thing about that is you're in danger again of equating. Wonder Woman and Superman too much. I mean, I know that I know that they didn't actually do that in Batman versus Superman, but it, it's sort of close enough. And you might find that when they investigate that plot, it leads them too much down the same path of what they've done before. And I, I think they would much much better off defining this Wonder Woman different to the Superman. And I think so far they have uh, just them. Um I'm talking about more just in the sense of leadership styles. I, I don't know if uh, this version of Superman is in any has any interest in leading the team. Uh, there's certainly nothing to suggest that he does. Well, that's the better angle to go down, though, rather than I thought you were saying you wanted them to be hope versus pessimism, there, which isn't which isn't a function of just pure leadership. Um, that, that's what I thought you meant, p- purely down that moral viewpoint i'd oh, certainly be interested sure. in seeing them show two different types of leadership that that would be interesting and that would be different because as you say superman has no expressed no current interest in being a leader in fact you can't even see that the clark kent that we saw is is not a leader per, you know purposely not a leader yeah and that's fine um if superman's content to ha- help out and listen and listen to commands then fair enough um Sounds all right. Yeah, I mean, I suppose my thing is, if if Superman is willing just to be a team member, I mean, do we even know that he's going to be part of the Justice League, really? Or is he just going to fly about, do his own thing, and then come in the end and beat up the baddie that they can't defeat? Well, the post credit scene where he races the Flash, 
he says, you're off the team if you lose, kind of thing. You know, it's a joke. Ah, right, yeah, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. considering himself part of the group, part of the team, you know. Oh, well, there you go. Maybe he's just going to come in and beat, beat up the bad guys at the end. Like, give give them a little try first. You know, you let Batman give a go first, and then you send in the big guns, and if the big guns don't work, you send in Superman. Yeah. Reasonable. Let's move on to Superman as a character, as he's handled in this film. So... He's very much the catalyst for this film beginning. You know, um, Batman wants to recruit the uh, the Justice League to honour him and make pick up the slack from him not being around. Fair enough. It's a good motivation for ju- forming a team. You know, we've got this guy that could render the team pointless, but we need a team to hope to stack up to this super powerful thing and this beacon of hope, etc. Fine. All good. Uh, the handling of Superman as a character was less prominent i think uh i mean he was he was around and he's resurrected then he spends a night on the farm and then he's fine and then he's christopher reeve after that which from my point of view i quite like seeing that version of superman the the optimistic kind of cheesy guy uh, who um talks about truth and justice but not the american way and uh generally seems to be quite chipper because it lets henry cavill act and it lets him show his natural charisma which is something that we haven't really seen from him before in this particular role i would be happy though if they didn't bring in too much cheese i think neil before pod loves a pun <laughs> but i hate whatever give you that idea <laughs> i really really hate a pun I, 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 I don't want him making cheesy jokes constantly i mean i see that they want to go to a more positive person and i think as a beacon of hope a bit of positivity is certainly going to go a long way with that my my problem might be though if they really do make him Christopher reeve that not only does that not allow him to stand out enough by himself as his own superman but without a bit of conflict he could be a very boring character if he is just always happy, no trouble. As soon as there's a civilian in danger, he goes and saves it, and that's it. I, th- I think they're going to have to do a lot to try and make this character interesting in any coming film. Yeah, and that's that's not necessarily a problem for this film, because he's hardly in it. He turns up in the second half and has a very distinctive purpose, so his purpose is to, I suppose, love being alive again, which is something that he outright states at one point um his so his his role in the future of films isn't really the problem of this film i think um i can see where you're coming from that might be hard to make a more positive upright version of superman interesting um i don't necessarily subscribe to that idea though i think uh, i think that's just an excuse for some writers not being good enough to characterize this particular character and any meaningful way so you know people that say that that he's boring and stuff it's the it's the same problem that they could have had with captain america but they dodged quite easily oh i don't probably not easily but you know they dodged it well i agree with you it's not a problem for this film um certainly um I, i think it comes down to just being uncertain again as to what the baseline for the DC film is, which is where we started, which is what we talked about for so much of some of the film. And now all of a sudden he is this way. Certainly it's good to see Henry Cavill being a bit more charming because he really can be. Um, but it's, it's, it is that uncertainty. I don't, I don't know where this goes. I don't know where it came from. I don't know where it goes to. I don't really even know necessarily what it means for this film because we were sort of promised in in Batman's dark vision of the future uh, an evil Superman, which we then didn't get because we changed the film. And we were sort of promised in earlier Superman films a Superman who's somewhat conflicted, who's trying to be human and not really being sure what that means for him. But now he seems suddenly okay with it. So death was apparently a good thing for him because it enabled him to become more human. But how does that work? And there's this 
constant uncertainty that this all is built on, which even though it has indications for the future, it still makes me think about what's going on now in such a way as I'm just not sure what it all means. Yeah, and I'm not sure they've thought that far ahead. I think the I think the the basic issue that they wanted to resolve in this film was people don't like gloomy, moody Superman. Let's change him into what people do like, and then whatever they had to do to get there is is besides the point, I suppose. And I think um, I got the impression in the previous films that they were building to that version of Superman that that he becomes sure of himself you know we, we've discussed this before how the flip the script on captain america and superman whereas captain america is this kind of un- unwavering paragon of virtue where superman is a bit more human and uncertain and i think a character arc of him getting there to that point where he is essentially the captain america that we've seen in those films would have been good you know and the the essentially skipped it you know as soon as he dies he's fine he just comes back and he's you know, after a night on the farm, he's all right, and he's he's what you kind of associate with Superman after that point. And that, that's the that's the problem. Some of the most interesting things that could have been there, as you say, have been jumped over. That's that's what I feel like I'm left with, which is a big shame. Yeah, but, I mean, it was cool. Um, it was cool seeing him return, you know, triumphantly in the final battle to his classic music you know the john williams classic music that everybody loves and and things like that. you know those are all kind of little crowd pleasing moments even if it is a little bit unearned because you haven't taken that journey for him to get there they threw that in with the batman music as well didn't they that's right yeah yeah and that's that batman music again i love that batman music and uh, so hearing them both in the same film was was a bit of a fanboy moment that i, I will confess to getting a little bit excited about that's, that's proper Easter eggs, though. For those that don't know about it, they don't miss anything if they don't catch it. Whereas those that do hear it, they get this extra little bonus. I like I that. So I think that's. I well wonder done. if you can be fairly certain that most people know what the Superman theme is. Well, it's by the age. That's mm. all. I mean, if you, I mean, when we were in the cinema, we saw a little uh, kid go in who was who was certainly under the twelve thing, and therefore was only there with his parents. Like, and obviously that's a bit extreme, but going down to that end of the scale, they might not know that. They might yeah. not know, know these theme tunes because they only know the ones, maybe, they only know superhero films from when the Avengers started, you know. Yeah. yeah but including them, sorry, but including them in films like this, in little snippets like that, keeps them alive and keeps them going on. And I always try and encourage people to watch you know, the Christopher Lee Reeve uh, Superman or Tim Burton's Batman because they're all part of what brought us to the superhero films that we've got now. And you, you see elements of different bits and pieces all in there. Even yeah. just watch Smallville, they had the John Williams music occasionally. Most notably in the final episode. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I always feel like the the Superman theme is very iconic, and it is. You know, it's it's up there with Star Wars and Indiana Jones with those big iconic themes. Um, so even if you don't know it, you'll maybe pay attention to it when you do hear it. That's the kind of that's how good John Williams was when he came up with this stuff. Um, I don't know. It's just good to have him associated with that music again, just as a fan of the character, or as a fan of this medium of comic book film adaptations. Kind of on Superman's resurrection, which was a part of a plot point in the film, I I wasn't a huge fan of the way they did it. Because it started off with a conversation of, maybe this mother box thing can resurrect Superman. And they have no real reason for thinking so. And they have a slight argument about, what what if we bring back something that's wrong and... And even that factors into post-resurrection. But it seems like they get from the beginning of the let's do this to actually doing it very quickly. I mean, the scene change between the discussion of it and them digging up the body is pretty darn quick. Um, and even the Flash references it. He's like, is this <clears> like disrespectful or grave robbing here? You know? Yeah. It's, I, I don't know. I, I kind of have the feeling that that 
that pool inside the uh, the crash ship is a very good sort of MacGuffin generator. Considering the, the last thing that came out of it was that sort of massive berserker thing, that you're like, uh, do you really want to use that again? Are you sure? And you're going to combine it with the alien tech, which Cyborg Man can't currently control. What so if you just ended up with Robo yeah. Robo Superman coming out of there and killing everyone? Yeah, is it not every single film? It seems like they go into the, the ship and do something else with it. You know, it's... yeah. Thank Thank God they didn't destroy that ship at any point because you know they've been using it now for quite a bit. I think Superman should just throw it into the sun and get it over with. You know, it's yeah, it's more trouble than it's worth. I think they did build up though to not build up. That's the wrong word. I think they did make logical steps. In the sense that somebody described the box, and then Bruce Wayne says, well, if the box can do that, can it do this? And whereas it moves fast, I, I think it's unfair to say that it was, it came from nowhere. It, it did come from somebody making a discuss, discussion of the boxes themselves. It must have been Diana that was talking about the history. And then from that, why not have your your character whose prime ability is his intelligence have a wacky idea fine i completely agree it then just moves on it's really fast it's let's just get this done and even when they do it it's pretty much a um a can barry run fast enough scene and you kind of know that he can so there's never any threat of him mistiming it there's not a previous scene where they point out that even though he's fast sometimes he runs at the door and it's not open when he gets there and he has missed time things, missed time things. So there's no, there's no threat of this, of it failing. So it's not a powerful scene because it is just a, uh, a bit of action with no real stakes. But I'd, I'd say it's unfair to say it came from nowhere. I'm, I'm happy that somebody as clever as, as Bruce Wayne can come up with an idea based on a description of what the thing is. Yeah, it's just a bit of a leap that he goes from maybe Kryptonian cells can be regenerated by it and all this stuff. I don't know. It's... Well, I think if you're listening to the scene, though, I, def- I got the impression that he was somebody going, maybe Kryptonian cells can do this. Has anybody got a better idea? I'm not hearing the ideas here, guys. I've got an idea. I think we should give it a go. And everybody's got, oh, it's not a very good idea. But then they all admit, <laughs> yeah, but I'm clueless. I've got nothing so from Ben Affleck's Ben Affleck's delivery, you get the idea that it it is a hail mary play, but this is exactly the sort of point where they need a hail mary play. So again, where is the leap in that? Other than, dear God, are we desperate? I mean, there is some discussion of the kind of morality of it, but again, it goes too quickly. There, there's a lot more in there. There's the there's the idea that, that Bruce Wayne is essentially no better than Lex Luthor by suggesting this, and it's very possible that he'll end up creating another abomination, like the like Doomsday. Um, there's all of that, and and there's just again it goes back to how quick this film moves. There's just no time to explore the real re- implications of their actions before they're doing them. And the next thing you know, they're breaking in and they're, you know, electrifying the amniotic fluid or whatever it's called, and. And then Superman's back, and he's he's angry for a few minutes. Well, I won't challenge the speed, and I won't challenge the fact that they suddenly get over the Superman suddenly not being evil for any more than he's just a bit put out. But it, I think we've already covered that. You know, somebody said we need to completely change this film round, and there was probably some poor schmuck in the writing scene going. I need to take out the entirety of Angry Evil Superman. <laughs> How the bloody hell am I going to do that? Fine. Do you know what? Screw you guys. This is what you're getting. And he's to be angry fair... and shirtless. And, well, well, when he's shirtless, he's angry in this film. That's you got to do, do what you got to do. You know, it's cold. <laughs> you know. But, but to be fair, to, again, to come back to what we've already said, to be fair to the writers, even though they then had to take out all of Angry Evil Superman... They still gave me what I think is one of the best action sequences in in the entire film, where it is everyone v Superman. So yeah. I'd say, as we as we started, they saved it by by coming up with something right out of the box. And that um, there was a really great line in that scene, the bit where Superman sees Batman, and he you know that that 
drives him to anger more than anything else. And he's holding him by the, well, by the chin, really. And he said, you know, he says, "You won't let me live. You won't let me die." It's this idea that, that Batman is con- constantly telling Superman what he should be doing. You know, the at least from that kind of warped perspective, it's just. Qu- it's kind of darkly funny that Superman would be like, right, he didn't like me when I was alive and now he's, he doesn't like it when I'm dead, so how do I, I win? Think I find that, yeah, that's slightly perverse that that's funny because I think that's actually one of the better points of the the, the drama. Of it. I think that that is, that is the show I wanted to watch. You know, that is the that is the darkly horrible truth of what's going on that I wanted to see expanded into more of the film. I think that was, that was a, it was too true to be funny for me. Um, it was, it was just, it was really quite horrible. Um, and, and, and that's that, unfortunately that's all we got because then the, that writer then had to end that scene and go back to happy, charming Superman, which again, not, not saying it's necessarily a bad thing, but, but yeah, they just had to drop it before it could really turn into something bigger and potentially more important because of it yeah chris what did you think of the superman resurrection the the mechanics of it happening and the subsequent consequences or the, the, the mechanics were a little bit clunky i did like the the wonder woman put in our reservations and the only reason she turned up she said was for him not for batman not for the team it was for him and i, I kind of like that element of it they had to get him back somehow because they had obviously decided, oh, we were bringing him back. So I don't know how else they could have done it really within canon that they currently have within the film, you know. I got the impression from Batman v Superman that he was going to come back on his own. It would just take some time. So the the dirt rising from the grave mm. was that indication that, you know, he wasn't, he was only mostly dead. To, to coin, you know, old cartoon phrases or whatever. Yeah. Slight, yeah. Slightly dead. It's slightly dead. Partially yeah. dead. Uh, yeah. I, I, don't, it, I don't know, yeah. That's how it played out in the comics we were doing Princess well. Bride then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's how it came into, in the comics as well, he was very much, um, he, he was put into some kind of bizarre kind of stasis, Kryptonian stasis, where he wasn't actually dead, but it was taking so long for his body to heal itself after being so profoundly damaged. And I don't know. See, I don't know if that would have had the payoff that they would have wanted. That people would have just, oh, what? So he just wakes up at just the right moment, yeah. and he just finds out about the end of the world happening, and he go rushes over and saves them. Well, isn't well, that you need convenient? To have an entire film about the resurrection of Superman. That that would you would need yeah. a Man of Steel two to be about to be essentially the return of Superman. Yeah. Um, you know, not, I, not to be confused with Superman Returns, which is the bit, a different thing. <laughs> the bit, the bit that confuses me more than uh, the fact that they sort of went to the pool, they wake him up, they do the sort of fight thing, and he's all back. Is more the fact that at the end, Clark Kent can walk back into his old newspaper job and go, <laughs> "Hiya, guys." Um, now I know some of you were probably at my funeral, and you're going to have questions. <laughs> I'm going to answer them all. There is a very simple explanation for this. I just can't think of it at the moment. Come back to me. and <laughs> It's a private family matter and I do not wish to discuss it. <laughs> yeah, I do, not wish to, uh, I do not wish to discuss me faking my death, um, which I'm assuming is the only excuse that could have been delivered. I also don't want to discuss the fact that conveniently this has happened around about the same time. <laughs> As the return of Superman, we are going to gloss over this fact. You guys are going to completely forget it. By the way, have I told you, my pal Bruce here just bought a bank to get our farm back. Um, <laughs> also, what about the what about when he did come back to life and it was in front of the monument and everyone was just yelling Clark all over the place? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot. Yeah, she does say Clark. Clark, it's me. It's There's me. Like a policeman in front there. of the, like, the two policemen. Yeah, We're probably. <laughs> Probably in the modern age with body worn cameras, so at least they've got everything filmed. <laughs> but um, I do wonder about that. Is like how they're going to spin that? Unless, unless they held a very, very, very private funeral. They went, "Where's Clark?" And they went, eh, "He's away at the shops." Well, we uh, or he's on an undercover. He's, yeah, he's an, on an undercover investigation. Attended. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, we see that his funeral is attended by at the very least Perry White. 
So ah, right, okay. You know, so yeah. they've done that. Okay, well, that's <laughs> I couldn't remember the the funeral scene from uh, Batman v Superman. So I couldn't remember if there were many people there or if it was just his mum well, and like the whole town Lewis and, and like uh, Perry White and presumably a few colleagues and and so oh, great. So, so yeah. good, good, jo- good job that he's went right back to the the main the main spot there. Not not only, but he's going back to that that small town where they'll go. I'm sure we saw you buried. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, it's to be fair, whoever you know, whoever wrote that whole sequence, that whole Return of Superman bit, wasn't thinking about the future film. They were like, Haha, "Good luck, future writers. Yeah. I'm not going to answer this question for you. You're screwed. Bye." You know, because you just see him at the end, and he's wearing the very traditional Clark Kent garb. You know, he's wearing a suit, the long jacket, and uh, yeah, the assumption is he's back at his normal life. But they but they don't bother answering why because they don't have to. Because someone else will have, some other idiot will have to do that in the future. Yeah. yeah, it depends. It depends. It's how, how many films away is that going to be? And the writers yeah. like, I hope I don't get on that job. I don't want to be the guy standing <laughs> there and brainstorming, going, "How do we explain this?" Who uh, wants to write Man of Steel too? Yeah, not me. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll come up with something. I'm just going to employ liberal use of the memory erasing kiss from Superman Two. <laughs> Superman just flies around, kisses everyone he knows. They all forget. <laughs> It would be weird, but, but you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, so secret identities, they're not really a thing. Certainly not in this film. It's pretty weird because Bruce Wayne tells everyone that he's that Bruce Wayne is Batman pretty early on. Um, there's the bit in Aquaman's little fishing town or wherever the hell he is, uh, where he's just wandering around saying, Bruce Wayne, Batman, same person. You know, they're, he's like yelling at everyone around who'll listen. Uh, it's the bit where that it's like, is like very remote, that's, really, that's really bizarre of you Bruce Wayne and then he swims off <laughs> yeah. very remote town though yeah there's also the okay. fact that he grows a full beard within a few hours <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the bit where uh, the bit where he says continuity going, beard yeah. yeah I'm going north tonight the next time you see him he's speaking to Aquaman and he has a full beard Cle- after being clean shaven in the previous scene yeah but then he does shave again so, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I grow a rubbish beard. I, I grow a terrible beard. If I'm off uh, work sick for a couple of days, I grow a rubbish beard. So I know <laughs> never to try properly. But he grows a proper, proper beard within hours of a flight. Yeah. I don't know. It's nitpicking. And it's probably a it's probably a problem with editing and reshooting and all that crap. But um, still, it's one of those things. I like to nitpick. Why not? Yeah. So we can pretty much assume from the films now on everyone's going to know who they all are. Yeah. Uh, there are no secrets. So Aaron, how do you think Clark Kent can come back from the dead? It's time for Crackpot Theory Corner, if that's such a thing. <laughs> I, I, you got me on the spot there. I've got, I've kind of got nothing, because as you've indicated, it's not possible to have anything. So. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit of a bizarre one. It was. I was like, surely you would just see him. I, I was expecting more a scene of him back on the farm with his mum or something. You, know, you can imagine that well, he's maybe that. taking the yeah. quiet life, you know. But then you see him in the middle of town, and you're like, yeah. all right, well, he's obviously back then. It's like you could, you could probably get away with hiding out on the farm and being Superman yeah. and not being Clark Kent. Plus but there's, I mean, there's problems there anyway because you see that a lot of people know that Lois Lane is connected to Superman in some profound way because in Man of Steel they're very close and then in Batman v Superman she's in a relationship with Clark Kent so in my head I've come up with the explanation that everyone at the Daily Planet feels really sorry for Clark Kent because they think that they, they think that he doesn't know that Lois is only with him because she thinks he looks like Superman <laughs> Very nice, I like that angle Yeah, it's just like, ah, oh, poor Clark she, he has no idea that Lois doesn't really like him she's like he just looks a little bit like that other guy and she's all fixated on him. <laughs> it's just a thought. I don't know. Again, a bit of headcanon, a bit of nitpicking. Why not? It's just a little bit. I just, I'm like, is this the thing where secret identities aren't a thing? That's cool. <laughs> okay, fine. Well, we know from the TV shows that they only care about them and so far as they care about them, you know, and uh, how many how many episodes of The Flash does Barry Allen just unmask in front of whoever, you know, and... Um, I've lost count of who doesn't know who, who Oliver <laughs> Queen really is, and you know all this kind of stuff. It's just um, it's a thing that it's a thing that comics used to be defined on, 
you know, the, the, the normal guy who's a superhero. Um, or the superhero who pretends to be a normal guy. That's DC's way. You know, Superman is the real person, whereas Clark Kent's a kind of thing that he does. Um, all that stuff. But in recent times, it seems like the secret identity thing has fallen away. You know, if you look at the first Iron Man film, at the end of the film, spoilers, he says, I am Iron Man. So he's just, I'm not bothering with this crap. And then they didn't really do the secret identity thing again until Spider-Man Homecoming. In Marvel, anyway. Mm. So it seems to be something that's not at the top of anybody's list. Yeah, and even then, several of them are sort of unmasked by government agencies and Civil War and all that sort of stuff. So yeah. it, all, it all sort of pans out. But, um, yeah, I, I just... It was just one of those things that made me sit and go, oh, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. But like you say, it's future writers, so we're going to disappear off to the world of Aquaman and whoever else. So they don't really need to address it for a good few films now. Yeah. And when they do, they'll probably just wave it off and go, oh, you faked your death to cover a story somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so we've talked a bit about action sequences. We'll focus quite a bit on the Superman is um, Superman resurrected sequence. Um, which is, you know, which is one of the highlights in the film. I actually really liked the first uh, coming together of the Justice League. Obviously, Superman wasn't there, uh, where it was essentially just a hostage situation in a kind of uninteresting arena. But I liked what they did with character in that a little bit. You know, the the bit where Barry freaks out because he's never been in a fight before and he doesn't know um, what to do with himself, and then Batman says to him, "Save one person, and then you'll know what to do after that." And so he saves one person and he's like, oh, that's cool. And then he goes and runs in and saves more people. And then eventually he gets to the point where he's like, maybe I can't actually fight here, but I can help the people who are fighting when, you know, when he pushes the sword back at Diana and so on. I think you've described it quite well. I mean, I like the fact that the Flash in this is a little bit clumsy and untrained because he he, he is, he, he, he trips, he falls, he slips, he He's sort of a bit of a klutz when it comes to the things, and I like that because it is a film with a few very powerful characters, and if you had a fully powered, fully competent Flash in the mix as well, it becomes very difficult to come up with a good threat. And if he's going to... show for that, you know, yeah, if, why that keeps happening. <laughs> if he's going to learn... Uh, how to be a superhero and how to save people, then who better to learn off of than sort of Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, you know. It's, I, I, I kind of like what they've done. They've not made him like the ready-made, you know, oh, he's already out saving lives and he's already out doing this, that. He's already got his life on track. No, this is the, the guy that's still a bit socially awkward. He doesn't quite know what he's going to do. He's still trying to sort out stuff with his dad. So I, I like the direction they've taken with that. And that scene kind of highlighted it a little bit yeah and um and even then during the final battle you get batman sort of directing him as to where to go so and he runs the wrong way as well i like that you know, <laughs> it's like you, you need to save these people they're to the east and he's like which way is that I no idea and he just keeps running in different directions until he's like i'm pretty sure this is the right way and eventually he gets there i think a superman points in the right direction yeah but, probably and then yeah. between that I, I did quite like that scene i don't quite understand how you can carry an entire building without it collapsing unsoundly however he's I, superman he's because he's superman yeah <laughs> i just Not imagined superman. lumps of building falling i mean how many people was it an entire building full of people or was there one person in that building that he could have saved a lot easier and he was just showing off i'm just saying <laughs> yeah it's um i guess it's a very cartoonish type visual that isn't it where supervisors carrying the building on his you know oh, effortlessly yeah. across and then the flash is really like really hyped that he's pushed one car a few oh, don't get me wrong it made me it made me chuckle a lot despite the fact it makes no sense but uh, it made me chuckle a lot yeah um there are only really those three major sequences actually that i can think of well there's the the amazons fighting um steppenwolf which is I don't know, it goes on for too long and they're dragging the mother box around with a rope and and all this stuff. It's just... I think they did it to sort of give them a little bit of service and to show, yeah, they are quite badass when it comes to saving it, but there was nothing they could do. Because yeah. after watching Wonder Woman, you're like, well, how would they give it up? They wouldn't just give it up, you know. Whereas we, we'll, you know, we'll give the Atlanteans a little bit of a, a grace because we've got no idea how competent they are. However, yeah. we know how competent the Amazons have been. So how did he get it? 
I suppose it's just trying to serve that a little bit, really. Yeah, and I think some of the action is let down a bit by some really dodgy visual effects. You know, the I mean, I talk about how CGI is a useful tool, and I think um, whether there just wasn't enough time to render stuff properly or not. I mean, there's some some sequences are really beautifully put together. The you know the one I talked about where I suppose that sewer sequence, you know, the hostage situation sequence, that is essentially Barry's sequence, because that's about him learning where he fits in the fight. Everyone else kind of knows their place. Um, but there'd be, so there'd be moments of like these, these beautiful visuals, and this crops up a, quite a lot in the end battle, and then they would just be marred by this really you know, almost PS2 level cutscene type visual. So it's, there's, there's a particular scene where Superman shows up and I think it is just before he uses super breath. Oh, I can't remember if that's the exact moment. But it looks like he's just so horrendously badly animated. Um, it's just for a few seconds, but it really sticks out as if, it, you know, I'm just looking at a still from a video game. And that, that kind of ruined some of the action for me because it was just jumping out at me how little effort had been put into rendering in some cases. I do. I, I didn't pick out as many scenes as you did that had dodgy CGI. I, I know you've seen it a couple of times more than me. Just, just one more time. Just, just one more time than me then. Uh, but I, 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 there were odd bits where I was like, the the Superman scene is is one that I was thinking of. It's like you know you sort of think well that's a bit blocky and a bit, especially when you're so used now to the the CGI being amazing in these films. That they they really do get it right, even and even in other DC films as well, you can't knock a lot of the CGI as much as the plot and what they're doing with it may not be great. The actual CGI itself is pretty good, whereas this seemed to have some some bits. But whether it's because they've not been given the same amount of time to to process and to do it correctly, you know, if they've been working on a particular shot and then they've been told, oh no, hang on all those shots that you've been working on, they're all now gone. You've got to focus on this completely new thing uh, that is not what we planned for at all. And they'll go, oh, oh hang on. All oh, right, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. All right, we'll have yeah. to draw bits that we've already caught for other films or, you know, bits we shot that we weren't planning to use or, you know, we'll rejig it and that will throw them off. Yeah, forgiven slightly for the kind of issues that cropped up during the production, fair enough. But at the same time, this film cost something like $300 million. So there's kind of no excuse for a film to look as bad as it does in some cases when it costs that much. It's just, it doesn't seem to add up for me. We've kind of covered the, the links to the wider universe because we talked about the previous films, obviously. Earlier in the in the discussion, we chatted about the, the previous um, entries in this franchise. But... The post credit scene seems to hint at something that they might do, or, although judging by how everything quickly, how quickly everything changes in this filmmaking opus that they're trying to put together, um, it might not. It's like an X-Men post credit scene where it's meaningless because they never come back to it. But the idea of Lex Luthor recruiting his own Injustice League, uh, what do we think of that? I mean, I really like seeing Deathstroke and obviously, as an Arrow fan, I think we've got the definitive live-action Deathstroke on there. I think, um, but that's, again, another podcast. I have no, almost no opinion on this version. I think his costume looks cool. Um, but he only has, like, one line or something like that. But I think the idea that... I, I think the idea that Lex Luthor might be doing that thing that you you said the, the they should have done in this one, Chris, is the idea that he's going to recruit some evenly matched people to the rest of the Justice League yeah I mean it seems that that's what he's going to do he's going to twirl his metaphorical moustache and come up with uh, his come up with something. moustache yeah it does I don't know I, I kind of have the feeling that as soon as they find out oh did you hear Lex Luthor's broken out of prison instantly you would have Batman, Cyborg Superman and everyone going well, where is he? There he is. Let's get him. We've got him. Done. <laughs> Roll credits. It just... I, Cyborg I don't... just yeah, hacks into every computer on the planet and then yeah. turns on the webcam and sees him immediately. Yeah, yeah it was like he was able to sort of infiltrate um, Bruce's network pretty quickly. He's able to sort of hijack a, an alien spacecraft that he's never been near before. 
before. So I, I imagine he'd be able to find however um, <laughs> Lex is hiding his, his trail pretty quick. <laughs> so I, I don't know why they would go, oh, he's escaped from prison. We'll give him a few months to come up with something and then we'll get, you know, to make it a slightly more fair fight. Um, but you've got to let them have their narrative things and their little excuses. I'm being very nitpicky by saying that. <laughs> But, you know, I do think, like like you say, we've got to take these post-credit things now with a pinch of salt because they keep changing what they're planning for a bit. You know, I don't imagine Lex is going to be the main villain in the Aquaman movie, <laughs> so we're probably not going to be returning there for a little bit. You'll get a post-credit scene in Aquaman where Lex recruits whatever the villain is in Aquaman to his cause. <laughs> hey, possibly, you know, you never know. It's... It, I, I, I do like the, it's going to be the evil Nick Fury scenes. You know, <laughs> like, it's going to be like that. I I don't know if um, I always have the feeling that they sort of hint at Deathstroke or whatever to get people excited about the next film, and the post credits things always seem to be like, oh, don't worry if you were disappointed in this one, we've hinted at something better maybe round the corner. <laughs> you know, you've waited until the very end of credits where the foley artists have all been given their due. It is now time. <laughs> It is now time for for us to hint that there may be... If you did not like this and you're now disappointed, here is something for you. It's someone in an awesome-looking costume. Uh, Off you go, yeah. I wonder if the only thing they can really do with some of those things, though, is lead up to individual heroes' solo films. Because it seems like if they do create a legion of injustice to go against the Justice League there's a big danger that it's just going to become day at the office style films because much as I did get something out of Ultron it was still very much and the Avengers show you what they did on Thursday and I think there's a big danger with some of these post credit scenes building up to just that it's just oh we need to involve these characters in something so let's just show you what they normally do but it's a bit weird given how they're all pointed towards the stars for some kind of cosmic battle but then someone decides that they've got a funky new weapon to use out on some small country in south america and we should we can't really solve this cosmic problem for another couple of days, so it's just something to do, really, isn't it? Battling Deathstroke, so might as well. But how on earth can you know? How on earth can they play on that level to make their plots anything but silly? You know, how can what on earth is is Lex Luthor going to do other than just piss people off from now on? It's a good question. Um, on one level, though, it might be good to have an Earth-based threat, threat for the next Justice League movie, if they ever make one, um, rather than go straight to the more cosmic stuff. So somewhere in between this and Dark Side, you've got Lex Luthor's band of villains. What they'll be up to, no idea. But, you know, he'll um. rec- I imagine he'll recruit Deathstroke, who will be a match for Batman. He'll recruit whoever Aquaman's villain's going to be. He'll recruit Reverse Flash, maybe. Although, why the hell would Reverse Flash work with him? Uh, for Superman, I don't know. Dwayne Johnson's Black Adam character can probably take him on. And so it seems on. a bit too neat, though, that it feels like... I don't know how they're going to make it without it being forced. I mean, if you really just does build another team yeah. to be a black mirror of that team, it will just seem like some sort of cosmic joke. I mean, that whole idea of you you match a hero character against an equivalent villain for the final battle is is a tried and trusted formula and it, it does work but only if there's a reason that you can suspend your disbelief as to why they end up together if it's just and the heroes go down the corridor and the door opens and just quite by chance takes out Batman and puts him in the same room as Deathstroke so they must fight it, so when, no, when that door opens, do you know what Superman, you go through there, you can twat Deathstroke in about half a second and be back with us by the time oh look we're on to the next thing, brilliant, well done you know mm-hmm. it, 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 the ridiculousness 
needs to be needs to be defeated. His team needs to come together for some reason other than Lex Luthor is bored. Yeah. You know, this is Lex Luthor has been has been shown to be the anti Messiah prophet of Dark Side. What on earth does such a character need with Deathstroke? I can believe Deathstroke's a brilliant assassin, but what does the anti Messiah need? With a brilliant assassin, he, he, where does this go? You know, and it almost factors into the purest conception of Lex Luthor in the Batman v Superman film. The idea that he wanted to count, come up with something to counter the threat that Superman could represent. Not that he does represent it; it's the fact that he could. If this guy turned against us, we'd be screwed. There's nothing we can do. So they injusticely could do him. Could be an extension of that, as in Lex Luthor thinks the Justice League are unchecked and need a counterbalancing force to come into play should they, you know, should they turn against the people they're trying to save. And in his diseased mind, that makes sense, fair enough, so he recruits all these people. And ultimately, that was the premise of Suicide Squad. You know, well, was, Superman decided to kill us all, you know, here's how we might stop it. That, that's what I was going to say, is this not falling into the exact same trap that we've said they're guilty of already, which is yeah. going to these ensembles too soon. You know, if you get introduced to Deathstroke v Batman as a standalone thing, would you then feel more like, oh, wow, they've got Deathstroke in it, when they come to unite uh, these characters and you, you they come up with their own sort of, like you say, the Injustice league style thing? Would you then go, oh, well, actually, that's a pretty badass villain. And fair enough, you maybe get introduced to one uh, villain in Aquaman or whatever else they're going to do. But yeah. it's still going to be the exact same as this film, where you walk in going, well, I know a little bit about Wonder Woman, and I have kind of know a little bit about Batman, but I don't know any of the rest of these. And that would be the exact same thing you get there. And they've, yeah. they've rushed to Suicide Squad going, let's pull all these villains in together, all right? We're not going to do any build-up to them. We're just going to introduce them in a bunch of cut scenes at the beginning. And then they go to, you know, this film, Justice League, and go, right, we're going to pull together a lot of the heroes. We've not really been introduced to a few of them, but we'll do these little scenes. And, and then they're going to go to the next one and go, right, okay, we've got Lex Luthor. We kind of know him, sort of. And we've got Deathstroke, who we, we did a cut scene with, and we've got this character, this character, this character. Done. And and then they fight. And it's like, uh, all right. It the just, latest is that Deathstroke's getting his own film, so that could be interesting. But Well, well then then you can build it in. Like, like I say, if, if you do it and you give these characters a bit of a backstory and a reason for people to then want the team-up film, the problem is that they've already hinted at the team-up film which means that they're probably planning in DC terms for that to be coming within the next few films. Yeah. Um, it's not that they're hinting that this is way, way, way off. This is them hinting that it's coming up very soon, and I do think it is far too soon. If they had waited until the cut scene at the end of the Deathstroke film to introduce it, maybe. Yeah. But the fact that they've already went, oh, guess what's coming next? You kind of go, oh, really? Don't hint at that yet. You know play your cards a little bit closer and and hint at something for Aquaman, maybe. Don't go for the next ensemble hint. Yeah, I agree. I think... Um, I mean, it was good to see Deathstroke. Again, fan service. It is just fan service, but yeah. it's kind of empty fan service, because unless you watch Arrow, you've no idea who this guy is. Or read comics, obviously. Yeah, or play, I mean, play that Arkham game that he was in. I <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's a known character to people that are sort of watching that, that sort of canon. That's fine, but I, I do feel that they're sort of going, yeah, we're going to jump from this ensemble to another ensemble to another one, and we're going to pull all these characters in so we can tick the boxes and go, oh yeah, we've had that character in film, we've had that one, because the fans all love to see an on-screen version of this. You're like, no, no, just hold it, hold it and introduce these people slowly, and then when you bring them together, it'll feel so much better. Yeah. The fans will reward you for it more and everyone will actually look forward to it. Whereas this is sort of teasing so quickly that I'm kind of like, well, I don't I don't want to see that film yet because I imagine it would be terrible. Whereas if you built me up a little bit, then I'll go, oh, right, do you know what? I am looking forward to that. No, I have already seen that film and it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a tough one. Uh, well, it's not a tough one at all. And also, yeah, he, he can't get. You know, we know he can't get the baddest of the bad and all the kick-ass people because they're all busy in Suicide Squad. So, yeah. yeah well. <laughs> well, it's it's that kind of thing. If like, it, he could recruit Reverse Flash, but what business would Reverse Flash have listening to Lex Luthor? You know, and that's you need to establish uh, that, and I don't think they can. And I think you need to establish reverse Flash in the first place yeah. as well. You've established Flash, but then you go, "Oh, well, this is someone who's like Flash, but not from this timeline sort of thing. He's a villain against... In which case, you need to introduce him in a Flash storyline in order for him to be a villain in this, similar to the way they've done in the TV shows over yeah. on the other side. You know? It'll all make no difference when they do Flashpoint, which they are doing. <laughs> Well, I, I imagine that it's a very good reset button where they can go, let's get rid of the bits that we did wrong, and <laughs> this is gone, and this is gone, and this is gone, and now it's like this. We've yep. set it in stone. The reset button has been hit on the universe, and it now has this. <laughs> And all the people that were too expensive and whose agents demanded too much are gone, replaced with new people who we could afford better. Yay. And, yeah. This is Bruce Wayne now. Deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's, yeah, we'll just have to see what happens in, in the future. And I think, um, I don't think, I think my guess is as good as whatever DC will do next. You know, I think that's how ill thought out some of this stuff is which is unfortunate you know they haven't done the marvel thing of building it and earning it and and slowly building towards something that they know they're building towards i mean infinity war is something they've been building towards since the avengers and you know they're going to get we're getting that next year whether it's any good or not is up to is is up for us to decide but the fact is they've taken us on that journey from earning the earning our trust and you know, earning the money that they make by making good films, and DC haven't necessarily done that quite yet. Yeah, I kind of feel sorry for DC because they had a head start on Marvel, a massive head start on Marvel in, in regards to sort of getting film franchises and everything on on the way. Yeah, Warner and Marvel owns, to... owns all the characters. Like, that's, mm. yeah, it's a shame. So, uh, I think we've torn this apart enough, and we should come to some sort of conclusion. So. Time for wrap-up thoughts. Aaron, do you have any final thoughts on this film and what you want to see next and where where you're sitting within the whole DC DC bubble, I suppose? I think I want something that's not possible. So I'm not sure where uh, how I'm going to comment on, on where they're going next. I I saw enough in Justice League that made me think that there are people out there who can really write and create this. Whereas this definitely is a flawed film with all the problems we've discussed. Nonetheless, there are good character moments, as we discussed, between like Flash and Cyborg, the experienced Bruce Wayne trying to create a group by encouraging and advising Diana by training and 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 mentoring Barry Allen that there's a, there's enough in there that I still actually did enjoy this film despite its obvious problems I'd like to see more of the slightly Darker plot lines still, though, I think. Even if just to differentiate from everything else that's out there at the moment, the, the Marvel films are great fun. The DC TV shows are mostly still trying to be great fun. And whereas I don't want to block that, obviously, I really would like to see DC choose a direction for their films and make it different and make it unique and give us something that stops this genre becoming so samey that all of a sudden everybody just gets bored with it all at the same time. And that's a hell of a burden to put on one house that is struggling to define itself. But I do think if they could do that, 
if they can find their own niche, pick one style, really push it hard and differentiate it from the rest, then not only will they produce something that I'm actually really wanting to see, but it will be good for the whole industry and help it keep going uh, before it, it, it collapses on under the weight of a bunch of producers just trying to make the same thing over and over again and hope the audience doesn't notice long enough to give over the money in their wallets. So, so ultimately I can't say this was a, as it was, was the great film, but I can say that I came out of it still feeling better than I went, uh, in, uh, and ultimately uh, I'm, I'm very happy with that. That was very concise and detailed summary. Well done. Uh, Chris, do you have any last thoughts? Uh, after that very concise and well placed summary, I feel that I should say absolutely diddly because I've got nothing, <laughs> nothing great to say to sum up. Uh, just basically what I said at the beginning, I was really, really rooting for this film and it disappointed me a little bit. I still watch these things because I'm a mug and I keep going to them. But, um, hopefully, um, hopefully they take the good elements out of this and they, they manage to build themselves something. I don't know if it's some studio execs needing to take their hands off and, and let the writers run properly with it or, you know, get decent, um, you know, not showrunners, but decent producers and writers that know what they want to do, sit there in a boardroom and come up with a plan and don't keep changing it every time someone does a podcast or does an <laughs> article saying why their plan is pants. Because it seems that at the end of every film they have to take stock and they rebuild their entire universe from scratch again and they replan it out. If you've got a vision, stick to it, come up with it and don't listen to what we say. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, my final thought is, yeah, I liked this. I didn't love it, but I liked it a lot. I was entertained. There's parts of it I think are really strong. There's parts of it I think that are not so strong. Uh, I agree, I echo the sentiments that DC need to pick a lane and stay with it and and let it go to its logical conclusion. Instead of trying to... Instead of being convinced that their ideas are bad, they should work harder to show why they are good. So, let's define something by what it is rather than what it is not. So, the, this film could have been a good showcase for why their darker outlook... Uh, is equally as valid as Marvel's more popcorn-y, uh, uh, optimistic outlook. Uh, there's no reason that both sides of it aren't equally valid. It's just that DC, so far, have not been as succinct to being able to show it. So I think that I do completely agree that find a direction, go with it, and don't be afraid to experiment with things. But this was all right. It killed a couple hours. It's always fun to see these characters in live action. They're doing a good job with most of them. Um, and I'm kind of interested to see what they do next, what they come up with next and where it all goes. So that is my final thought, I suppose. So on that note, I will thank my Justice League for coming from this corner of the globe to assist me in this conversation. So, thank you, Chris. You're welcome. And thank you, Aaron. You're also welcome. Good. Now, let's go back to our respective film franchises and, and do what we do. That was our very long, comprehensive discussion of Justice League. Thanks to YouTubers 331ERock and nsend1117 for the supply music. As always, if you like what you heard, then please click the subscribe button on iTunes, YouTube, or any major podcasting app. And join us on the next Kneel Before Pod. <laughs>